I see the signs, hear the lies, the deceitfully blind. Seeing red, yeah, because it's weaving like vines. Evil crimes, people die, Marxism's alive. Seeing red, yeah, I see the rise of the tides, the decline of the times. Now ask yourself, is this fine? Seeing red, yeah, I guess the NBC News and the Democrats went and changed the color to blue. We have never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. Hi, welcome to the third episode of Seeing Red Yet. In this episode, we expose the cultural Marxist indoctrination of our children. I hope this episode paves the way for parents to finally realize what is going on in the schools, and how this agenda is a very grave danger to not only our children, but to the future of society. Now, because of education, miseducation, whereby psychology, uh, um, communism, is presented as a psychology class, so you don't know you're becoming a communist. See that? And you pay your money, to and so you're actually paying for, you're giving the rope that they can hang you, but you don't know you're being hung yet. I but decided to go back to school myself, a little painful, it was Catholic school, but we went back to elementary school to talk to some kids. Take a look. I want to be a president. So you want to be president of the United States? Mm-hmm. You think you're smart enough? Yes. You think you're strong enough? Yes. You pretty enough? Mm-hmm. You are pretty enough, that's true. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I don't know if I'm going to vote for you. Why should I vote for you? I will, like, ask the rich people to give some of the money to the government and ask the government to give the people people who really need the money. Who's voting for Kaneem for president when she grows up? Oh yeah? Okay, I represent the rich people now. I don't want to give any more money. Well, then you're greedy. Oh, I'm greedy? No offense. <laughs> the Toronto District School Board, the largest school board in Canada that has a study guide about how to talk about communism. And the message for high school teachers in Toronto is, hey, it wasn't that bad. You might ask, what could the TDSB possibly do for an encore in terms of wacky left-wing progressive political correctness? Oh, you'll be sorry you asked, folks. You see, Toronto's enlightened public school board, whose last director of education just happened to be a serial plagiarist, is now indoctrinating tens of thousands of grade 9 to 12 kids the lesson du jour, hey, communism isn't such a bad thing. As exposed by Blazing Cat Fur last week, the TDSB is distributing a teaching guide entitled Challenging Class Bias. The nub of the guide, communism, that political system steeped in the blood of millions of innocent victims, well, it's essentially it's received a bum rap over the decades. The, TDB, the TDSB explains, quote, the Cold War's polarization of capitalism and communism influenced most Western governments and mainstream media to equate capitalism with democracy and communism by comparison with undemocratic and totalitarian political systems. <laughs> wow. Kindly note, the TDSB provides no evidence of a benevolent, non-totalitarian, democratic, communist state. Clearly, the millions of people who were brutally murdered or merely starved to death under communist regimes, well, they were just capitalist tools, I suppose. You know, we're not making this up, folks. Many teachers will even tell your children, hey, communism's a great system. It just, it hasn't been implemented properly yet. You know what? The teaching guide has a lesson for people who think that starvation is the fault of communism. Let me read this next one. People experiencing poverty are affected by consumerism so oral what that means is if if you're poor it's just that uh, 
you want too much. Yeah, you've been conditioned to why. So those North Koreans who are starving, no, nah, it's just the capitalists who are giving them false sense of consciousness. Let me read one more quote and then last word to you. Our consumption perpetuates injustices like sweatshops and child labor. So as in the fact that we want stuff, it doesn't enrich us because we're all building and producing and creating wealth. We are to blame for poverty. The fact that we want things causes poverty. This is not an accident or ignorance, Oral. This is written by Marxists to try and transform our kids into morally neutral people. Again, I, I don't know these individuals, but it certainly sounds like psychobabble and sociological babble. Uh, it is, in a sense, betraying an educational mission mm. uh, where uh, our young people deserve and are entitled to be given a rigorous education where they can judge uh, what is of value, what are the differences, uh, not just some sort of facile moral equivalent. And it is uh, something that borders on, on the tragic mm. that in a country like Canada, which has offered hope to so many people around the world, which is a free democratic society, imperfect as all democracies are, there's such an obsession with criticizing what we have, attacking our system of government, our judiciary, that they are blind to anything else, and therefore uh, they somehow feel uh, uh, compelled to equate any flaws in our system, yeah. imperfect as it is, with the worst kind of you know, dictatorships You swap the word elsewhere. communism for Nazism, you see how evil this teacher's guide is. Hi everybody, let go of the Legos. One school has already banned the colorful building blocks, claiming they teach kids a dangerous lesson. What is that dangerous lesson, and should you keep those away from your kids too? Big outrage. We've heard all kinds, heard of all kinds of bans in schools, bans on certain clothing, cell phones, even playing tag. But now one school has gone too far in its attempt to teach children what it thinks are important lessons. They are banning. Get this, Legos. Big Story correspondent Douglas Kennedy is here now with an explanation. Why Legos? John, this is a small school in Seattle, Washington, which recently banned the building blocks from its classrooms. So the lesson they say they're trying to teach is about the evils of private property. <laughs> When it comes to toys, it's not uncommon for children to claim ownership. Most psychiatrists say it's a natural stage of child development. Not so at a so-called emerging curriculum school in Seattle, Washington. The Hilltop Children's Center recently banned Legos after teachers say their students' behavior began to, quote, mirror a class-based capitalist society. A society that we teachers believe to be unjust and oppressive. How ridiculous is this? This is really just preposterous. What we're saying is bad for children to play with Legos with each other. Uh, they're not instilled with the values that the teachers think they ought to be having. The controversy began when a group of eight-year-olds began building a Lego town like this one, complete with a city center, shops, and houses of various sizes. After two months of work, teachers became dismayed that some of the second graders were claiming ownership of some of the quote cool pieces and that one child wouldn't let another use Lego Town's airport which apparently required being in possession of a Lego Town plane. According to the teachers the children had begun to incorporate into Lego Town their assumptions about ownership and the social power it conveys. So the teachers say when, when the kids claim ownership, they are becoming part of the capitalist society, which is bad, they say. What, what, what do you say to that? Well, the teachers really here have the explicit intent of indoctrinating these children into common ownership and communist viewpoints. The school says the children have now learned an important lesson, namely that collectivity is a good thing. And they say they have reintroduced Legos to the classroom with new rules. Number one, that Lego pieces can only be owned by a team, not by an individual. Number two, that all structures are public structures. And number three, that all structures will be limited to standard sizes. So they're going to limit the size of the structures. Are, are they also limiting the size of these kids' imaginations? I think so. Really what we're talking about here is trying to teach these children that everyone should live in the same sized home, the same format. We're talking about Soviet-era public housing, central planning. That's what they're trying to indoctrinate these kids in. It's something American parents need to really be thinking about. 
No one from Hilltop would comment on camera, but in a statement, the teachers called the Lego ban a success, teaching children, they say, a vital lesson in shared ownership. They also say their teaching methods are being adopted across the country. So, John, I guess that means that we are going to hear more of uh, Lego bands. More in Hugo the Chavez, less Donald Trump. Uh, Douglas don't, Kennedy, don't, thank you very much. Don't bring much. Hugo Chavez. Coming up, the this revolutionary teacher in Southern California who's been calling for revolution to the countless socialist groups infiltrating and organizing student walkouts and protests. And it's not just limited to capitalism. Our morals and principles are under attack as well. The state of Massachusetts used a website for sex education called Maria Talks, which promotes abortion as like it's totally easier than it sounds, end quote. Here's how the site responds to a question about whether a girl can get an abortion if she's under 18. Quote, okay, I totally know that this information can sound pretty intimidating and overwhelming, but I promise you the reality of getting an abortion is much easier than it sounds here. It continues, I know it sounds crazy, but just keep reading. This can really be done, and young women do it all the time here in Massachusetts. The site goes on to glow about how safe and easy it is to get an abortion, while at the same time expressing concerns about the mental side effects, mental side effects of giving a child away for an adoption. My son was given to us by a superhero, a teenage girl that got into trouble. A superhero. Well, talk to me about the side effects. Oh, yeah, it's much, much better to kill your baby. And if you happen to be in the market for an abortion, all the contact information is for Planned Parenthood is reading right there for your children. In Utah, Planned Parenthood supports a puberty education uh, maturation program for the kids age 8 to 12. Their site provides links for educators that cover everything from how do you even have sex to what is a condom. And while they do mention that it's not a horrible idea to talk to your parents, they stress that you need to talk to an adult who has information, which is an amazing coincidence and an interesting qualifier because another message our kids are getting is parents don't know what they're talking about. I do. I do. Watch Al Gore telling kids for like the 40th time to not listen to their parents. Young people ask their parents in that era, explain to me again why it's okay to have legal discrimination on the basis of skin color. And when they could not answer that moral question coming straight from the conscience of young people, that's when the laws began to change. He has said this many times, don't listen to your kids on um, global warming. Van Jones has said it, and we just showed you last night, um, a union that is saying, hey, we've got to get the kids, got to get the kids. Parents now in New York are being ignored despite their outrage over the fact that convicted felons are teaching their children. Mayor Bloomberg has thrown his hands in the air and says, there's nothing I can do about it. Quote, there are very strict rules in the existing contract that prohibit the city from deciding in this case whether these people should be in the classroom. They are convicted felons, but it's in the contract. Well, I say to hell with the damn contract. If the government can say to hell with the contract with GM, then why can't we do it when it comes to our kids in the classroom? America, if you can't get convicted felons out of the classroom, if you have Marxist revolutionaries writing Texas, uh, textbooks, if you have citizens being groped by the TSA, when is enough enough? Cindy, let me start with you. This is Social Studies Alive, our community and beyond. Your daughter was sick, and she needed to do some homework. Right, they brought she came home as makeup work. And what did, what did you do? I started reading it, and the more I read it, the angrier I got. The chapters are about indoctrination, minima minimalizing anything that has to do with America. It talks about being protesting, uh, global activism. It's, it's all about getting your child comfortable. I just, I just wanted you to see this. Child care is important, but it's not free for people in the United States or most. Families have to pay for child care. It can be very expensive. Some people have to pay as much for child care as they earn in their jobs when they don't have enough money to pay for other things such as food and health care. In some countries, like child care is a public service. For example, Denmark and Vietnam. Child care is free or costs very little. Well, let's all move to Vietnam, everybody. <laughs> um, it makes it easier for parents to work. Then the question is... Do you think age of this for the eight, nine, nine year eight, nine year olds? Do you think child care should be a public service in your community? Well, of course. Obviously. Um, then you have the, uh, the uh, global community here where we just can't really be Americans anymore. It's global. I like this one. 
This is uh, voting. Yeah. And what is this ex ex telling the kids to do? This is that they should go out and they should demonstrate. Isn't that the one on demonstration? They should mm -hmm. go out and they should demonstrate, and mm -hmm. you should have a voice in your community. Oh, it's and they're just kids. It's fantastic, all the things that we can learn. So what have you, and health care here, by the way, health care is really a right, especially in places as glorious as Vietnam. Um, what, what have you done now? I've gone through the steps of trying to have that book removed. I've gone to the curriculum specialist who's in charge of doing this book. I was told it will not be removed from the classroom. It will stay another year until the book comes up for its technical re review, and next year is the time that it will be reviewed. I have to tell you, um, this lady who's now at the airport, um, uh, I said to her, I said, you've got to pull your kids out of school. I, I home teach my, uh, my children. And I said, you've got to pull your kids out of school. And she said something really, really great. She said, no, because then they'll just do it to all the That's other right. kids. That's right. And I had never looked at it that way, but she's right. right. But the reason, the genesis of this show is to get people to stand together. Cindy, do you have, do you have other parents with you in I, the school? I do have other parents. I have school board members. We have a brand new school board. They are addressing these issues. They're, you know, I'm going through the process of having this d gotten rid of. And the new school board is helping me to get rid of this board. How many people ha had no idea uh, two years ago how far down the river we have sold our children? It's amazing. It's amazing how far down. Glenn, how did you find out about your daughter's well my my daughter uh, she came home and told me that first off the movies are being shown in her school not only Al Gore's movie uh, Inconvenient Truth and not only the uh, George Soros story of stuff but she told me about a health care or a health teacher that she had in a health class he was putting the movie sicko on as a gold line based standard to show how socialized medicine is so much better than privatized medicine but America just hasn't caught on yet and uh, additionally making comments like uh, the Constitution is 400 years old uh, why would we follow a constitution 400 years old that was drawn up by a bunch of rich old white guys? Did he, wait, wait, uh, did he actually say 400 years old? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, he's, yeah. he's yeah. smart. Yeah. But who I, I'm very smart. It's 400 years old. <laughs> but really, I mean, wow. who, who cares about facts, you know, yeah, when, when, know, when they're trying to push an agenda, and that's all he's trying to do. So what have you done in the classroom? Well, he would say, yeah, I would like say, wait, that's not right. And... He was like, well, you know, bring me facts, show me, show me, you know, give me proof. You know, so I would do, you know, bring stuff in to support my answer. And the next day, um, and he would have showed the class. And, and when I tried to speak up in the class, because I was the only one in the class that had that view opposing him, he, he just like, he would mock me, he would just like, the like, kids. Glenn, so where is that ending? Well, I don't know where it's ending, but it's just begun because for a year and a half I've been trying to have these issues addressed. The principal and the superintendent have been totally disregarding the issue. This guy, he's even gone so far as to put Judeo-Christian scripture up on the wall, bring a t-shirt in saying Jesus was a liberal, and saying why would we follow this book as a society. The people in the community are just starting to be made aware of it, and literally when I finally had the issues addressed because of the community, the school board, at the last school board meeting, got up and left the room when the people in the community said, let, this guy, the community? let this guy be heard. Uh, Quakertown, Pennsylvania. Quakertown High School. Quakertown. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's and, unbelievable. That's just the tip of it. When I realize that something that I thought was a fundamental right is not a fundamental right, that is deeply troubling. Over 90% of Americans agree with the definition of traditional parental rights, which is that we have the right to direct the upbringing and education of our children as we see fit. We are getting very far away from our founder's idea uh, in the Declaration that we hold these truths to be self-evident. The problem with explaining parents' rights to a person as compared to free speech rights, free speech, you say, go look in the First Amendment, there it is. But for parents' rights, there's no place to go look. You have to go read a bunch of Supreme Court decisions to see how they found it, what they've done to it in the meantime, and it's an evolving standard. That's the problem. For the first time in American history, a majority of the Supreme Court no longer treats the parent's right to control and direct the upbringing of their child as a fundamental liberty. I'm an average father. I love my family. I love my wife. I love my children. I never thought that my rights as a parent would be taken away from me. He didn't start passing out until you up the dosage on those medications you put him on. I'm afraid this appears to be something else. And he asked about doing a drug screen, and I said, yeah, it'll be fine. I suggest you do a drug screen just to be sure. And he said, oh, by the way, I cannot get the medical records to my son 
without his permission because the law says so. He has to give us permission for those results? Children are entitled to medical privacy. We cannot release children's medical results to parents. How could somebody tell me that the law says that a parent cannot get medical records of their minor child? I have to ask my 13-year-old for permission. I'm just following federal guidelines. This is his right. We're his parents. What about our rights? It's not right. It's outrageous. It's offensive to think that that would go on. In the medical field, this happens frequently. And it's not just in the medical field. But this also happens in the area of educating our own children. It started in the 2004-2005 school year. So Dave handed me Jake's things. I looked at what Jake had brought home. It wasn't just his book bag, it was also another book bag. This is about introducing to my child sexuality issues at a very early age. And it teaches in kindergarten? It is our parental right to be able to be notified when they're doing this to our children and have the option to opt our children out. The principal agreed to meet with us the following Friday. I think you're both misinformed. She basically directed us to a gay, lesbian, straight educational network workshop. I don't want to discuss heterosexuality and homosexuality or the comparisons between the two at this early age and they made it very clear that they've decided to introduce this to young children and they were willing to do it behind the backs of parents and without opt-out. We went to the principal. I wanted to catch you before you leave and let you know that we both decided that we still want Jake opted out of these lessons. I'm afraid we can't do that. We had one final meeting. All we're asking is for you to make an exception for one child, just one child. I think we can work something out. And as I was sitting there, I thought, finally, we're getting some accommodation. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about my child. I'm not talking about the rest of the school. We didn't say, never do this. We said, when you do do it, as they stated they would, notify us first, and we want the option to opt out if we don't think he's ready for that. What I didn't realize was they were formulating another plan. They were keeping me there by leaving me with this promise and calling the police. Mr. Parker, I need to have a word with you. What? I want my son opted out, and I'm not leaving here until they agree to do that. When I was let out and put in the police car, I thought to myself, how far are they willing to go to deny us our parental rights? The heartbreak of moms and dads around the country is becoming universal. These are real life domestic issues that happen in this country on a regular basis. The legal situation for parents' rights is like a perfect storm. There's a threat from international law and there's a threat from domestic law. The international law threat is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. If that becomes the law of this country, then every parenting decision will go through the filter of the UN's standards for how children should be raised. A fit, loving parent who cares for their children is now put in the same position as an unfit, abusive parent under the provisions of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Our Supremacy Clause says that treaties are part of the highest law of the land and they override anything in state laws or state constitution. So this treaty comes into place, state laws are out, and the UN runs our families. President Clinton, during his administration, approved this treaty. So all that is left for the Convention on the Rights of the Child Treaty to be part of the supreme law of the land is for two-thirds of the United States Senate to say we want it to be so. Ms. Wilson, um, some other media outlets are starting to pick up on what I've been saying for a while, that we've got a problem with how we teach in our schools, and that often it's, it's related to a philosophy, it's related to an ideology that is within our school system. Is that the way that you look at it as you've been studying the system? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we've always said that there's been a real move towards um, uh, away, I should say, from kids learning fundamental basic skills at the very earliest uh, years in their schooling to be uh, problem solvers and higher order thinkers at an earlier and earlier age when they're really not prepared and they don't have the tools to do the problem solving with. 
The, uh, I mean, there's lots of theories on education, but we seem to be able to educate for years and years, centuries. We, we got to the point that uh, we were in the 20th century before we had all the radical theories uh, come in. What was wrong with the old-fashioned way of teaching math? I, used to, I remember my parents talking about the new math and thinking, well, that's kind of weird. Isn't there just one way to do math? Now I go to help my kids with their homework and it's math and Christina Blizzard wrote about this in her column the other day and she she talked to you for that column you tell your kid okay carry the one and they say what's that my brother didn't believe me when when I posted Christina's column on my blog my brother did not believe me when he said what do you mean they don't teach kids to carry the one anymore but they don't they've come up with new theories that don't make sense to anyone well I think they tried to uh, move away from uh, the kill and drill concept and they, they thought that well that's boring for kids well it's not really boring for kids I mean practice if it's well designed and um, can, turn, can be a game it, it isn't boring it's good practice it, it helps kids reinforce and become fluent in fundamental skills so that they're so automatic you don't have to think about it I mean, we do this in just about everything else we learn if you're trying to learn to play the piano or trying to learn to play golf you, you have to think about every single thing when you're first learning it. But with lots of practice, those skills become automatic. And what we see happening is that kids get into uh, the higher grades and they're still counting on their fingers, uh, relying on calculators. And what that does is it doesn't free up the brain to use those higher order skills. Kids' brains, kids' thinking gets bogged down into thinking what those um, number facts are or relying on calculators and without really having the um, comprehension of what they're actually doing. What's the solution here? Because when, I, uh, when school boards and school officials will actually listen to parents' complaints, then they talk about bringing in more consultants. And consultants generally end up coming with more theories, and those tend to be the progressive theories that say, as you mentioned, rote learning is bad. So learning your times tables, you know, I remember we had times table challenges. There's several problems with that in today's school environment. One, competition's a bad thing. We, you know, rows of uh, students would compete mm -hmm. to see who could get, do the best in times tables. They don't allow competition and rote learning is bad. So they'd come in, if we complain, they'll come up with a new theory, again, that nobody understands except the consultants. It seems to be a great uh, employment insurance system. They're always going to be employed because they're the only ones that understand what's going on. You'd almost think there was a conspiracy there, but uh, no, there was really nothing wrong with the way we were all taught to do math back in the day because it worked. And it worked for thousands and thousands of years because it, it, because it worked, because it was the most successful thing. Um, I think what ends up happening is that parents end up uh, at home teaching their kids themselves or paying for tutors because I don't see too many businesses like Kumon and Oxford and a lot of the other uh, tutoring centers going out of business anytime soon. So I think there's, uh, there's obviously a need for that there. and um, it, yeah, that, That's expensive though and a lot absolutely. of families just won't have the money. They can't um, afford it or they try and do it themselves until they reach a point in math where they can't do it anymore because you do reach a point where you And then the kids drop out of help. math and then people aren't going yep. forward and, in, in and the And we do see, system. at least here in Ontario where, uh, where I am, that there are um, math um, education has stagnated for the last few years. It's, uh, it's something that needs to be paid attention to. And I think what needs to happen is that we need to train our teachers in how to teach math. And we need to look at how the curriculum is structured because I think we try and do too much too soon before kids are ready uh, to move on. And, and too much outside of the basics. Uh, I don't know how they have time for the basics with all the other social engineering they have. Problems are going into regroups, and I mean, I don't mean to judge, and maybe it's just my old thinking, but this is insane. Yeah, right. this just looks insane to me. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's convoluted, and uh, I mean, it just—it's not clear thinking. They want the children to learn to add the tens first before the single digits group into tens. So that's what that's about. And they're... Uh, but but that's, uh, that to me seems like seriously dumbing things It, it is. And it makes 
math much more difficult than it ever should be because math is it should be an elegant language right. where you teach the simple simplistic way so you can understand it and here they try to make it much more difficult and even there's a standard algorithm this is the best way to solve a problem that's what young children should be learning right actress ellen barkin who you probably have never heard of if you're under the age of 50 tweeted i'm so glad to see new york state parents boycotting standardized tests today standardized is more like it she's absolutely right why should a unionized, semi-literate teacher have to adhere to standards? They should be able to teach our kids using any unique and creative method they want. Okay class, who can tell me what four times four is? Steve. Uh, 24? That's exactly right. Remember, just because this looks like a four on the outside doesn't mean it doesn't feel like a six on the inside. It's very important to respect that four's number identity. So what we have here is a common core uh, recommended primary. So this means it's recommended for primary use here in the state of Utah. Um, literature and writing or English language arts curriculum that's aligned with common core. For first graders. This is for first graders, so six-year-olds. I have a first grader. Let's just look at what the... What's the, what is this about? What is the purpose of this? You'd think this is about uh, literature and writing. That's what it says on the cover. You flip open and it says, the central question, and in the Voices Democracy theme, students use their voices to advocate solutions to social problems, that they care deeply about it. They're engaged in learning the following theme-related social knowledge and skills. And then they list them, social role models, social advocacy, respect and so on and so forth. So, well, that is important for a first grader. Yeah, right, is to, to, to learn how to be a, an advocate for social. <laughs> yeah, right. You're kidding. My, my uh, six-year-old does that all the time. Right, she, she looks what's wrong, about what's wrong in the world and says, how do I, how do I organize um, my people in my community to fix these social problems? Well, uh, the teachers are shown how to teach them how to do exactly that. One of the first things that they teach the six-year-olds is how to use emotional words. Now, I have to tell you, my six-year-old already knows the, the emotional words because she's... <laughs> we have emotional conversations, but it's not what they want. They're looking for is, uh, here's the instruction to the teacher. Tell students that when they write a call to action, they should include emotional words to get the readers to feel so strongly about the problem that they want to do what is being asked of them. This is not um, Community Organization 101 for college students. This is uh, English Language Arts for six-year-olds. Yeah. So we give examples, um, and they're very effective at this. So here's the example. Um, why did the writer use the word refuse instead of will not? Refuse is a stronger world, word that makes the ABC company sound as though they are hard to work with which may make readers angry with them. So, I don't know, are we, are we teaching the six-year-olds to kind of play fast and loose with facts in order to persuade and get the job done? Why did the writer say we could be without a park for months or even years? And this is the conversation to have with these six-year-olds. By stating the worst that could happen if the company builds houses, the writer appeals to the reader's feelings of anger. So we're teaching the six-year-olds to to stir up anger and fear in their readers in order to accomplish the social... Do you think it would be fair to call this um, indoctrination? I don't know what you call it. It's, it was, a, I call it astonishing. It's recommended here in our state. Goes on and on, talks about how to do emotional words. It gives, we should look at some of the, some of the workbook stuff on how to learn to use emotional words. Again, this is in the same, the same um, curriculum. So the child is to read each sentence and to choose the emotional word or phrase. So here's one. Uh, my mom always, what, tells me to clean my room or nags me to clean my room. And of course, they're supposed to circle the word nags. That's the correct answer because that's the emotional word. Of course, as a parent, I take issue with the, the whole t question itself because it marginalizes parents to use the vernacular. Yeah, that's astonishing. It's unbelievable that adults 
uh, actually, you know, may, may have actually reviewed this material and approved it. it. It'd be somewhat less astonishing if they didn't review the material and approved it. So they're very thorough in this um, approach to teaching these six-year-olds, and it's not just the six-year-olds, it's the seven-year-olds and the eight-year-olds and the nine-year-olds and all the way through high school, but starting them in, in, in uh, first grade to be social activists and to stir up emotion, not, not to teach with logic, but to stir up emotion to be persuade, to persuade others. So we've looked at the goals and we've looked at some of the um, workbook exercises on how to, how to use emotional words to manipulate people. Um, now let's look at some assessments and some homework activities. So, once again, uh, this is the script for the teacher uh, to read. <clears throat> teacher says, think of a school-oriented problem and, oh, I'm sorry, think of a school-oriented problem and present it to the class. And then, in italics, the school needs balls and jump ropes for students at recess. Okay, so they've identified a social issue. Now the teacher says, we're going to write a letter to parents about our problem. And you can see what the whole rest of this says. We want them to help solve the problem. We need parents to understand our problem. So we're going to use words that make them feel how important it is to help us. So now they've taught the kids how to stir up emotion. They've taught them how to use emotional words, and they're going to try it out now on their parents. And so right on the chalkboard, write anger, fear, and joy. So you write the sentence. The children have nothing to do during recess. Now, remember, the sentence is for your parents. Now, how might a parent feel when she reads this sentence and discuss the feelings and especially discuss how the parents might be upset or angry by the sentence? And that's the whole purpose of the, of the assignment, is to put all this stuff in practice. Again, these are English language arts, common core aligned uh, materials, uh, recommended primary in the state of Utah. Give them practice with emotional words. Feelings often cause people to act. As I read this and as I learned <laughs> the strategy and how, and how the, the writers apparently of this material want people to communicate, I'm starting to understand now why in social and political debates now we just talk past each other is because we just, I think, there's... Look for emotional words. Yeah, I guess. that's At least that's what appears to be happening here. Amazing. Approved for use in Utah. What's this book? All right, so this is for third graders. Um, but what, one thing I noticed as I went through third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh grade is they all had this similar theme where here for literature and writing, in the literature and writing class, the purpose and goal that's stated is that they want to, teachers to be measuring attitudes, beliefs, and dispositions, and they actually give them a rubric and a chart for tracking that. What? Yeah, and again, this is um, approved for primary use in the state of Utah. So we have a student observation form. Just zoom in on that. The student observation form on the assessment handbook is an informal assessment to, tool that notes growth and change in individual students' behaviors and attitudes. Wow. And so in the rubric here, you know, does, does the student effectively use the first person plural, we, an hour, to, affect, to advocate ways to solve social problems? Are they learning how to do that? Uh, and again, the rubric here includes things like, um, do they understand and know when something is unfair? Do they, do they recognize social problems? Um, do they work with others to solve group problems? Again, with changing behaviors and attitudes. And that, those are the stated goals here for the Zainer Blaser Voices Literature and Writing. Every grade has these. Every grade starts the same, saying that they want to measure growth and change in behaviors and attitudes. Wow. Well, I'm at the Toronto District School Board, and the TDSB folks has done it again in their ongoing campaign to promote the new normal. 
A couple of very provocative posters have been released for the schools in the TDSB district, and one of them is called Love Has No Gender. Now, this is very interesting. It shows all manner of couples. Of course, the most prominent couples shown in the illustration is that of two men and two women, because, of course, most marriages in Canada are gays and lesbians. Um, however, there are also icons showing polygamous uh, relationships two women and one man, two men and one woman, which the last time we looked was still illegal. As well, there is another poster called There Are No Rules for Being a Boy or a Girl. And this poster is also somewhat disturbing. It depicts a boy playing with dolls. Another picture depicts a boy in a ballerina costume. And yet another picture depicts a boy dressed as a drag queen. Orange hair, purple dress, pink go-go boots. What's the deal? Well, we made a booking with the communications people to uh, get educated by the educators, and we'll see what they have to say. Well, we're at the Toronto District School Board, and we were supposed to have an appointment with the communications people, but once again, we've been stood up. Nobody here uh, wants to speak about this poster campaign. Can't say I blame them. John, when you saw the two latest posters uh, in regard to uh, gender, love has no gender, and uh, how uh, boys and girls can or should be dressed when they go to school, what was your reaction? Uh, initially, I, I'm wondering if the TDSB is well beyond what it means about inclusive education and making students feel welcome to about indoctrination of students uh, and, quite frankly, bringing forward things that are counter to their parents' beliefs. When it comes to the Love Has No Gender uh, poster, it actually depicts uh, polygamous relationships, two men and one woman, two women and one man, which is still illegal. Last time I checked the Canadian Criminal Code, Absolutely. So the posters are uh, going against our Canadian laws as they stand today, as well as I think there's even an irony picture of a uh, student provocatively dressed, which would be against the TDSB's uh, dress code policy or acceptable dress code. Well, we're supposed to be teaching kids positive role models and uh, showing them things like this are just going to only confuse them. And I thought education is about letting kids be kids and teaching them the basics, uh, not some of the stuff that I'm seeing in these posters. Everyone at home is probably wondering, what's driving this? I think a lot of this is centered around the provincial government's uh, inclusive education strategy, Bill 13. Um, quite frankly, it's, it's a minority uh, groups that are bringing forward a lot of these concepts and trying to push forward uh, an agenda and a viewpoint um, that's counterintuitive to a lot of faith and religious beliefs. Well, what do you know? Once again, we were stood up by the communications department at the Toronto District School Board. Your tax is hard at work, but you know, cut them some slack, folks. How do you possibly explain the reason for supporting polygamous marriage in a poster campaign? How do you support the reason for having a young boy dressed up as a drag queen? But these are the educrats. These are our co-parents. I guess this, uh, they seem to know best. And who are we to even have the chutzpah to ask these questions? Meanwhile, the Toronto District School Board has been the subject of scrutiny in recent weeks over gender-based policies and links to highly explicit materials. Well, now new documents are coming to light that further blur the line between boys and girls. Faith Goldie joins us from our newsroom in Toronto with more on this story. What's this all about, Faith? Oh, Chris, if we have one more story like this, Sun News might have to hire a school board correspondent, I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, the Toronto District School Board has declared that staff and students have the right to use whatever washroom they want. Now, to be clear, that doesn't mean that they're installing transgender washrooms, not yet at least. It means the standard washrooms, boys and girls, can, by, can be used by both staff and students of any gender just based on how they feel that day. Now, let's take a look at this document. Uh, it's called the TDSB Guidelines for Accommodation of Transgender and Gender Non-Conforming Students and Staff. Whew, that's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, page seven of this, it says, all students have the right to safe restroom facilities, the right to use a washroom that corresponds to the student's gender identity, regardless of the student's sex assigned at birth. Requiring students to prove their gender by requiring a doctor's letter, identity documents, etc., is not acceptable. A student's self-identification is the sole measure of the student's gender. So that's page seven. Meanwhile, oh, and ditto, this, all ha this is the exact same rule 
rules apply for for staff as well. By the way, now meanwhile on page nine, we uh, we we've learned that school leaders should make an effort to hire and retain transgender and gender non-conforming staff. So there you have it, Krista. Uh, gender neutral washrooms and gender specific hiring instructions, all in one neat little package. Jeez, and. What's the criticism and what's the defense of all of this? Well, there's a lot of criticism. Obviously, a lot of folks are wondering, um, it, are, are students' safety going to be uh, in question here? Also, I mean, you're dealing with young kids, right? Even if there's not some sort of perverse aspect here, is this going to lead to more bullying? You know, 15-year-old boys, if they've got the opportunity to walk into a girl's washroom, especially at an age when girls are feeling, you know, they're dealing with puberty and certain questions, and, and, and they're already dealing with, you know, certain self-image issues. But we did talk uh, just very recently to TDSB, uh, their PR guy over there, Ryan Burton, and he just told Sun News Network that transgendered are among the most vulnerable. We're trying to create a safe, positive space for yeah. them. This, and this is very, very white. It's very sinister, actually, mm -hmm. because at birth, there's a tiny number of people who are born with the, the potential, at least, to have uh, both genders. Tiny, tiny number. That's a bit different. That, that's physiological. But when you're born male or female, you're not assigned. I mean, no one, but you see, the, the assumption here, what is behind this is, no, no, you're not. You are assigned. Your, your parents, the fascists, they give you a gender and you're raised in that, but it may be the wrong one. Look, folks from both sides, or perhaps maybe more so the right side of the spectrum, has said the TDSB has a specific agenda. And in the past few weeks, we've seen unsavory policy after controversial policy come to light, okay? And so uh, essentially today, you know, I just caught up with TDSB, um, their communications officer. Yeah. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, look, it, it, it's now at the public's eyes. Where are all of these things coming from? And this is what he had to say. If we could just roll that clip, perhaps. Yeah, please, let's roll that. What I can tell you is this came out of a mediation decision from the Ontario Human Rights Commission last year between the TDSB and a student. So this is coming out from the Ontario Human Rights Commission. So we're taking our lead from them in putting together these guidelines. I just... That's Ryan Bird. Mm -hmm. I used to work with Ryan. Come now. At News Talk 1010. He's a good guy. He, he is the sacrificial lamb, Michael. Let me tell you, the poor guy. I didn't want to put any of this up there because I thought the poor guy, he was such a gentle, nice man. Yeah. And all I thought to myself is, he is just the face of these insidious policies. It's not his fault, but he's just relaying a very truthful message, which is Human Rights Commission is basically, dare I say, indoctrinating folks. Um, this kangaroo court, where's Ezra when you need him, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> he's, um, just, he's just over the road, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Unelected, these commissions where there's a presumption of guilt, yeah. um, folks being charged, you know, out of the wazoo for what? For printing essentially facts. And so now we, we have to face this sort of rhetoric of, of assigned at birth you know, garbage, mm. essentially. But you know what? Can I just share a quote with you? Hitler said, he alone who owns the youth owns the future. So whoever these agenda setters are, they know exactly what they're doing, Michael. They do. I'm optimistic. I think that most teachers will say, oh, please, and most kids will not even be aware of it. I, I know with my kids, sometimes the, the, the gay issue is pushed, the rainbow flags and this and that. And even the gay teachers, come on, just learn, you know, do what you're told. So I, I think common sense will prevail. But Apart from anything else, we know there's a shortage of money in education. Teachers are, are worried about this, various provincial governments are concerned, and we spend money on this crap? Well, if Sun News will allow me to, tomorrow what I'm hoping to pursue, because Ryan actually suggested that what they're looking to do is actually expand and essentially create just transgender washrooms, so we don't have this overlap and people feeling uncomfortable. You know, the fox might feel like a chicken, but send them into the chicken's coop and some feathers are going to be It'll be like welcomed. the handicap washroom, when, right. you're, when you're desperate to go and the handicap one is empty. Do I? Should I? Because <laughs> you're, you're going to wait for the transgender person, you could wait for a very long time. <laughs> I was walking down the street in Dundas one day, and I happened to walk into Justin Trudeau. So I decided to ask him about Bill C-279. The recently passed Bill C-279 makes it legal for adult men to use school and public washrooms with five-year-old girls under the framework of gender identity and gender expression. Do you believe this creates a window for sexual predators to take advantage of our laws? And this is what he had to say. Uh, uh, the, the turning it into a bathroom law or a bathroom excuse uh, yeah. isn't, isn't yeah. a legitimate uh, argument and debate okay. and uh, awesome. proud to have supported with uh, supported yeah. Bill. Awesome. Uh, it's it. An anti-bullying and anti-discrimination program focused on gender diversity is drawing outrage from some conservative groups. Correspondent Claudia Cowan takes a fair and balanced look. 
I see a lot of hands. Instead of the three R's, these elementary school kids in Oakland spent class time focusing on gender diversity and how they can choose to be a boy or a girl or both. Gender identity is about in here. It's about what's up here and in here. As part of a program said to combat bullying, Redwood Heights Elementary brought in Gender Spectrum, an activist group whose mission is to create more gender-sensitive environments for kids. True or false, animals have only two genders. These fourth graders were told that in nature, things aren't always what they seem. Some dolphins have both boy and girl parts, and clownfish can switch genders. Gender Spectrum says that diversity applies to people, too. People can be girls, feel like girls, they can feel like boys, they can feel like both, and they can even feel like, as I said, kind of like neither. Critics say these lessons amount to indoctrination by activist groups. Public schools are here to serve children and to educate children on behalf of the parents not to cross the line and violate the rights of parents and families. District officials say the topic of gender expression is part of a larger effort to ensure students feel welcome and safe. Nobody's trying to influence the students to act in a specific way. We're just saying that if a student does exhibit these behaviors that they should not be alienated, ostracized, or most of all bullied because of it. This school is taking a very extreme position in inculcating these children at a very young age with gender confusion as opposed to gender identity. The school maintains most parents, teachers, and students had no problem with what was taught. But critics say there are not multiple genders, just boys and girls, and that this is the type of curriculum that could become commonplace throughout California if, as expected, pending legislation to teach transgender history to public school kids becomes law. In Oakland, Claudia Cowan, Fox. New this June on The Hub, meet the boy yeah. who became a superhero. Whoa, the ring turned you into She's Out. Dressed as a girl. Oh. I'm, I'm a dude. Ready to kick some She's Out. She, yeah. I can fly. <laughs> she's Out, a new Hub series. Check your local listings. She's out, only on Hub Network. From mastering a chord oh, yes! to mixing up a favorite treat, 10-year-old Ryan is a typical kid in many ways. But her story is more complex because to the world, Ryan is a girl, but underneath, she's still physically a boy. I don't feel like I was in the wrong body. I feel a girl in my heart and a boy in my brain. The fourth grader from suburban Chicago, whose face we agreed not to show, is what doctors call gender variant. Less defined than transgender when a person claims the opposite gender. It's, it's quite overwhelming. I, uh, I thought that it would be interesting and, and I was hoping that it would provoke an interesting discussion. It's the second most read story on our website, thestar.com, in two years. And uh, I've been getting phone calls from Austria, the UK, all over the US. And uh, as soon as the story went up, people started emailing me responses, uh, some good. They think that the family is very brave, that they're letting the children decide who they want to be. Uh, other people feel like this is perhaps an experiment that will have harm harmful effects on the children, that they're sending them out into the world in a way that invites teasing and taunting. Uh, I think that it's creating a really interesting discussion. Sometimes the comments have been nasty, and I don't think that those contribute to a constructive discussion. Let, but uh, for me, sure, me, we've received I, a lot of really interesting feedback. This is just another example of, of courageous families saying, OK, world, we're going to challenge you about gender expression. And we're going to challenge you by not using just adjectives to say strong boy or pretty girl, but we're going to challenge you to say actually authentic adjectives as such as pretty child and strong child. And Cheryl, does it surprise you that people are reacting so powerfully to this? Do you get similar reactions with your son? Absolutely. I mean, this is, uh, it, I think it's just, um, as a mom, we, we go through this kind of thing. We try to make the right decisions and we're doing the best for our children. And this is another example. I haven't met the family, but my hope is that there's an authenticity there, just as our family. I mean, my child, Dyson, started doing this when he was almost two years old. And he's a very strong extrovert child. So he's sending messages by saying, accept me for who I am. And this family is challenging us to do the same. We need to get to a place of acceptance. 
Well, Lisa, you're a child psychologist, and we, we have a family here that is sort of experimenting on a child. It's a, it's a human study of one, is it not? It, that's exactly right. I mean, we do have a culture obsessed, I mean, we have a culture that's obsessed with gender. I agree. And it's good that this gender topic is being out in the forefront. But I do think this choice is extreme, raising your child without a gender, because it really is a social experiment. And we don't know if it's going to have a negative outcome. And if it does, it's going to be the child that pays the price of that. And think about the relentless teasing, the bullying. I'm a little concerned that this parents that their their plan is going to backfire and although his identity won't be male or female his identity could be the he she boy or the ex boy or the and he might be a social outcast and that might be worse than if he had a gender in the first place you know most research is pointing towards biology having a very powerful effect correct well very powerful not, not powerful, exclusive but, but powerful exclusive. I understand yes so there's a likelihood that that biology is going to express itself and I, I, I know, I know males. Uh, he's going to be angry. <laughs> he's going to, you know what I mean? That he, they're likely to get that kind of a reaction from from the child. Well, potentially. that's possible. Yeah. And I think just having to keep a secret of something of what you are. So eventually, he's going to notice he has genitals. Well, but isn't that isn't that the the problem here in this story? Is that behind that isn't there a subtle message that gender itself? Is, is wrong. Yes. There's something wrong with having a gender. Exactly. And, and that's the part that concerns me because there's a, even in not having a gender, there's a message that it's, it's Cheryl's son. It's a different story. He has a certain way of expressing himself, right. and they're giving him the freedom to do that, as opposed to saying gender is, is a bad thing and let's hide it. Well, that's which because that's a subtle message. But that's that I, that we have a statement from Kathy Whitaker. Let me read it because she 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 I think tries to address this. She says raising a child gender free. She says I'm not telling the gender of my precious baby. I'm saying to the world, please can you just let Storm, which might if it's a he, make him angry by itself, just let Storm discover for him or herself what he or she wants to be. It, on paper, it sounds great. It really does. But communism sounds good on paper, too. That's all I'm saying. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, there's there's a difference between gender identity and gender expression. And um, you're absolutely right. Dyson said, I'm a princess boy. He identifies boy. And that and that's what's happening. But this this is a bigger question. I think you're right. There is the entire experiment p piece to it, but it is important for us to keep the conversation going. Why do we need to categorize? Why do we always need to compartmentalize? Why can't we just accept children for who they say they are, who they want to be, and get to a place where we're really focusing our energy where it needs to be focused on things that are going on in the world, not on where our children are trying to be happy and be who they are. Some Red Hook, New York middle school parents are outraged after their daughters were forced to pretend to be lesbians in front of the classmates. The Linden Avenue Middle School anti-bullying campaign focused on homosexuality and gender identity. Parents say their daughters were embarrassed by the role playing. Parent Mandy Kuhn told reporters, quote, she told me, mom, we all get teased and picked on enough. Now I'm going to be called a lesbian because I had to ask another girl if I could kiss her. Kuhn says parents were given no warning of the event and no choice to opt out. School administrators defended the workshop and say they're planning more. All right, this is Political Playground with Crystal and... Ella. <laughs> so, Ella, this week people have been talking a lot about marriage. And I was wondering if you could tell us, what do you, what is marriage, anyway? I don't know. You don't know what marriage is? What is, what does it mean if you get married? Uh, it means that you live together. You live together? And who can you marry? Can you marry, like, a car? No? Who can you get married to? Um, a person. A person? What kind of person? Like a person that doesn't have a wife or a husband. Uh-huh. 
And what makes a person decide that they want to get married? Like they get in love with each other. They get in love with each other? Mm-hmm. How does someone get in love with each other? Well, they talk and stuff and they say, you're not in love with you. <laughs> Here, leave this alone, baby. So you can marry a person, but not a car. Or a tree. You can marry a tree or you can't marry a tree? You can't. You can't marry a tree. And what if, so you're in love with a, little, with a boy. Are you going to marry Eli? I'm not sure. Not sure? Can Are I you old enough to get married? What? Are you old enough? Can you marry any person? Any person that you fall in love with? Like I might lose him when I get in love with him. Mm -hmm. What if you were in love with a girl? Did you marry a girl? Um, well, only here I can marry a girl. Here in New York you can marry a girl? Mm -hmm, because girls can marry girls and boys can marry boys in New York and a girl can marry a boy in New York too. That's, and that's good because you want people to be able to marry who, who they're in love with, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how come other places a girl can't marry a girl? I don't know. That seems strange, right? Tell me. <laughs> Some other places that haven't decided yet that you should be able to, if you're a girl, marry another girl. They should change that, shouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy because people should be able to marry who they love, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Put him up. Remember the good old days when it was Homer Simpson who taught parents how to talk to their kids about bullying? Let me help you dry those tears. Somewhere along the line, it looks like parents dumped that job on the schools. Just outside San Francisco, in Alameda County, it looks like kids will be learning the four R's this year. Reading, writing, arithmetic, and re-education. A vocal group of gay couples is pushing lesson number nine, a so-called anti-bullying lesson plan that will teach kids in kindergarten through fifth grade about LGBT, or lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender lifestyles. I'm a gay dad. I've been with my partner for 15 years, and we've raised both of our children since birth. We needed to address the issues of harassment, and we needed to address the issues of visibility, and the district answered that call. Alameda Unified School District is acting appropriately in response to both anecdotal knowledge and data that anti-LGBT harassment does occur in our schools, as it does in other schools across the state and country. Remember, this is about kindergarten through fifth grade. After this meeting, we asked Assistant Superintendent Sherratt to provide that data she referenced on LGBT bullying. In an email, she replied, quote, I have referred you to the district's legal counsel. It is appropriate that she respond. We're still waiting for that response. What we do know is out of the 140,000 schools in this country, from kindergarten through college, the FBI documented 135 bias incidents based on sexual orientation in 2007. But none of these 135 incidents are specific to grades K through 5. And Fox News reporting did not find any data evidencing bias incidents based on sexual orientation at the elementary school level in 2007 or in any other year. The LGBT, um, I classify them the new bullies on the block. The school is not there to teach my child um, the social issues of life. That's my job. The problem is there's a group of adults who are trying to superimpose their ideology on some children instead of just preparing teachers how to handle bullying or, or how to handle offensive language. So why have LGBT groups moved to the head of the class? Fox News cameras were in Alameda to capture over 10 hours of heated public debate. On one side, angry parents. And they said, ooh, your mom's a lesbian. Lesbian, lesbian, your mom's a lesbian. And she said, I didn't know what they meant. 
but I just felt really sad and I went and sat by myself. I'm 16, a sophomore at Alameda Community Learning Center, an avid fantasy role player, a metalhead, and a homosexual. I have been harassed by other students in my classes and even began to consider to just stop trying in school and to just give up on life. On the other side, more angry parents. My child has been the product of bullying because she's black. She has never viewed a single video in the classroom like Eyes on the Prize, the history of the Buffalo Soldiers, or African-American women writers from the 19th century. However, I am not requiring Alameda Unified School District, who is already strapped for cash, to incorporate these changes because I know how to successfully parent, educate, and instill value and self-worth in my child. You are choosing a book, and Tango Makes Three, that for three years in a row from the American Library Association, and again, libraries are choices, was the most challenged book. It's about two gay penguins who raise a baby penguin and they live happily ever after. And so again, nothing in this book about bullying or harassment, all about two male penguins. And the kids with traditional values are the ones that are considered, you know, bullies and no one's there to advocate for them. So how did the school board vote on the curriculum change? Member Spencer? Opposed. Member Tam? Yes. Member McMahon? Opposed. Member Jensen? Yes. Member Mooney? Yes. And the LGBT side has it, three to two. In a state that ranked third from the bottom in 2007 in fourth grade reading scores, Alameda's second grade students will be required to read Tango Makes Three. And by third grade, watch That's a Family. They're the best dads ever. The idea that they want to force this on children and parents and not even allow parents to opt their children out proves there's an agenda and they want to force this down these young kids throats. I spent three years as a volunteer at Franklin Elementary School. I experienced in those three years dealing with 40 kindergartners, kindergartners calling each other by a lot of different slurs, including the gay slurs that Ms. Englund says is just an agenda. It's not just an agenda, it was a need to keep the students safe. What did you Stop it. What did you do to stop it? Did you enforce the current school policy? Like let me finish my statement. What did you do to stop the slurs? Um, I dealt with that as a Christian. I'm very excited about going home and kissing my boys and telling them that we have had a victory tonight. And the school board should be ashamed of itself when not only does it vote to approve such a measure, but funds it in order to vote for it. This battle isn't over yet. Eleven states around the country now have bullying laws that include sexual orientation. That means that this scene in Alameda will be replayed in schools across the country. The beginning of 2005, our son Jacob was going into kindergarten and he came home with a diversity book bag. And in the diversity book bag was a book entitled Who's in a Family by Robert Scutch. And that introduces children to same-sex households. It introduces children to such things as Clifford and her dad's partner Henry. When we went into the school what we requested is parental notification when these issues are brought up by adults within the school and the option to opt our child out of this type of indoctrination. Said so we didn't think um, number one it was it was appropriate to discuss that with our five-year-old and that if we ever felt it was necessary to, to have that discussion with our son, we would choose the timing and the manner in which to discuss it with him. Um, and then uh, she said, well, she, she had checked with the administrators and, had, and they had said that this was not a parental notification issue. And in fact, that any adult in the school uh, could discuss homosexual families and homosexual issues with our children. And I said, I'm prepared to sit here all night until I see some form of accommodation as a parent. To make a, a long story short, the accommodation they gave was to put me in handcuffs and send me to jail. I couldn't believe that they were willing to arrest my husband because my, David, because my husband and I just wanted parental notification. We want to raise our children to know God and God has blessed us with the sacred responsibility to raise them for Him, to know Him, and to know His truth.
And new at noon, should society or government step in when it comes to changing the genes of a child before birth? That's the question high school students in Harrisonburg are discussing today. It's called transhumanism, or altering the human body through biotechnology. Award-winning journalist and author Ronald Bailey analyzed the ethics of the question. Eight high schools participated in the 16th annual event. Professor Myron Blosser says students will be confronted with this issue because of the new technology. Once you know where a gene is, then that opens up the possibility for manipulating that gene, cutting, pasting, changing. And so parents will eventually have the options of manipulating their DNA prior to having children. Okay, children, who can tell me what a condom is? Yes, Jenny. It flies around and it's endangered. That's a condor, Jenny, condor. Condoms are what we use to stop the spread of STDs. Yes, Fillmore. Can we do finger paints? No, we can't do finger paints. You kids want to get herpes, huh? How about a nice bucket of AIDS? Sound good? Now pay attention, all right? I'm going to show you the proper way to put on a condom. I, I ran against Alan Keyes. I don't know if you guys can remember Alan Keyes. But I, I remember him uh, using this in, a camp, in his campaign against me saying, Barack Obama supports uh, teaching sex education to kindergartners <laughs> and you know which I didn't know what to tell him um, <laughs> but but it's the right thing to do when most people think of Planned Parenthood they think of the babies it kills through abortion or the mountains of birth control it dispenses but another side to Planned Parenthood, which should be equally considered, is its obsession with sex. Sex toys, sex contests, sex balloons, penis-shaped balloons, penis cupcakes, vagina cakes, vagina macaroons, vagina fruit roll-ups, giant vagina costumes. All of these things play a central role in Planned Parenthood's community activities. But what's truly shocking is how these perverts are allowed unfettered access to our children while raking in government cash to sell them unrestrained sex. Oh, Planned Parenthood will claim that what they teach kids is scientific and age appropriate. But the fact of the matter is that age appropriate is a standard concocted by Planned Parenthood itself so that it can sell pornography to kids as science. Why would they do this? Just as the goal of a drug dealer is to make drug addicts, Planned Parenthood's goal is to make sex addicts and they follow the same business model. For instance, Planned Parenthood's gateway drug is masturbation. One of its primary resources for 10-year-olds is a book called It's Perfectly Normal, and it sells masturbation to kids with graphic images of naked boys and girls, boys and girls masturbating, men and women having sex, and even things like this, and this, and this. If a dirty old man showed these things to a 10-year-old kid in a park, he'd be arrested. But when Planned Parenthood shows them to kids in a classroom, it gets government money. But that's just the start. Once they get to high school, you know, right about the time that they hit puberty, Planned Parenthood tells vulnerable teens stimulating and intimate things about sex. Just look at what its website for teens says. The link to Our Bodies takes teens to a page that provides graphic displays of genitals and tells them about how pleasurable the clitoris is and how pleasurable breasts are to touch and massage. This section on sex and masturbation encourages boys and girls to masturbate and tries to dispel any embarrassment or hesitation in trying it. It also describes orgasms and encourages anal sex and oral sex. This section, titled LGBTQ, tells young teens that all sexual orientations are perfectly normal. The page on homosexuality, titled Coming Out, displays a teenage boy in an intimate pose with what appears to be an adult man. This section explains how to have gay sex using a condom, dental dam, and even plastic wrap. And for their viewing pleasure, Planned Parenthood's got a few things for teens to watch. There's a penis on my body. Awesome. Being gay is a little like being left-handed. Any protection? Yeah, of course. Amen. Now this is a clitoral hood. See it? Copy, rap, better ring a ring, no. This is how the penis and vagina get along. Go penis, 
go penis. Twinkie Trumpet Gherkin. Captain Winky Slong. Time to go inside and find out. Inside the vagina? <laughs> Calm down, Pete. You're leaking again. It's bad enough that Planned Parenthood is conditioning children to engage in sexual activity with the kind of stuff that we've just shown you. But Planned Parenthood of Upper Hudson's youth program, which includes children as young as 13, requires participants to be exposed to sexual deviancy on parade. Literally. Planned Parenthood of Upper Hudson's application form for the STARS program for high school kids states that students as young as 13 are required to attend Capital Pride. But this isn't just Planned Parenthood of Upper Hudson. As shown in this memo from 1969, Planned Parenthood's national goal is to restructure the family and encourage increased homosexuality as a sick form of population control. And that's why they expose our kids to stuff like this. Is it any wonder that one in four teenage girls has an STD? All this exposure to sex takes place before graduation from high school. When these kids go to college, they'll be bombarded with sex-themed parties put on by Planned Parenthood Vox groups. Here's a brief look at some of the different ways Planned Parenthood spills its pornographic material to undergrads. Like this poster of a penis monster attacking a naked girl in a condom bubble. Is this image from a Vox party something that Planned Parenthood considers medically accurate? Here's Planned Parenthood doing its part in reducing men and women to sex objects. A party with no pants and free safe sex kits? That just screams date rape. Maybe a Planned Parenthood sex workshop about pleasure, desire, and orgasms is more age appropriate. At least your sons and daughters can enjoy the vulva puppet show and leave with a free sex toy. What Planned Parenthood education booth would be complete? without a fisting kit for homosexual college and teenage students. But hey, America can sleep well knowing that its tax money is being put to good use, right? This is what Planned Parenthood is all about. Get the kids addicted to sex so it can sell them birth control. When teens catch a sexually transmitted disease, it sells them testing services. And when a young girl gets pregnant, it sells her an abortion. This isn't education, it's indoctrination intended to drum up Planned Parenthood's abortion business. Help us break the cycle. Go to American Life League's Action Center to find out what you can do to stop the madness. You might recall that school was once about history, grammar, and arithmetic. Well, not to the Toronto District School Board, who's now taking your kids' education in a whole new direction, namely the bedroom. In the curriculum these days, gender politics and new forms of very kinky sex education. All right, back at Thompson's here in Toronto with more, not just on this sex education and I gotta tell you, I blushed when I read some of the things that they're suggesting kids do. I didn't even know you could do these things. Not to mention a proposal for a queer-centric school uh, where a meeting was held last night and the media naturally was shut out of this public meeting. Yeah, regarding this queer-centric school, it's a new proposal by a former Toronto School Board trustee, a student trustee. His name is Fan Wu, and he says the point of the school is to have students think critically about sexuality. He explains what's behind the creation of this school. We did hear from him uh, last night, even though the media was shut out of the meeting. Listen in. Well, first of all, I want to dispel the segregation myth, the myth that, you know, the TDSB might be wanting to create the school to segregate queer students, segregate lesbian, gay, bi, trans students. That is not at all the case. This school would be a school of choice, which means that straight people, uh, or straight students can enter. Um, students from all financial and academic backgrounds would be absolutely allowed to enter. And the goal of this school would be to bring people from different backgrounds in one school under this umbrella of the queer-centric school. Okay. Now, is Doesn't that kind of sound like what we have right now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's surprising. It's a proposal before the Toronto School Board and, and there was a meeting last night and we're still collecting uh, information as to what happened at the meeting right inside the meeting. Now when it comes to students and their sexuality, Alex, as you mentioned, the Toronto School Board put resource links right on their website and here's one. It's called positive.org. Now it gives advice to students on how to foster positive relationships 
But what's shocking is that it includes an example of a bonding experience of shoving vegetables up one another's body parts in a sexual way. There are many graphic messages on the website that, Alex, I can't repeat on TV now. The Coalition for Positive Sexuality, they say they're an activist organization, and on the website they say, please help to con uh, continue providing teens with candid sex information materials. It's one thing to hear about it, but if you actually read the website, it is shocking yeah. what they suggest your kids can get involved in. Exactly. What do I know? What on earth are we teaching our children? That is the topic of tonight's byline. Tonight, a truly shocking story from our school system, one that floored me when I heard about it, one that still turns my stomach. We're used to dealing with a political agenda in our schools. I think most of us know that the schools in this country work politics into the, the school day on a regular basis, and it tends to be left-wing. We've discussed that. Today, what I'll show you is worse. In fact, if you're watching with kids, I want you to get them out of the room now. You need to see this so that you're aware, but kids do not need to see what I'll show you in a minute. This seems to me like a one-off. It's one teacher uh, who has a, a clearly chosen highly inappropriate material, and I just want to reinforce that the material that was reported to have been used was in no way connected to the Ontario Health and Phys Ed curriculum. This was highly inappropriate, and the fact that teachers in Ontario feel comfortable enough to bring that type of material, explicit material, material that parents would not want to show their children at that age, into the classroom speaks to the ethos of this Liberal government, first under Dalton McGuinty and now under Kathleen Wynne. Uh, enough is enough. The Toronto District School Board clearly is out of control when it comes to this. This is not the first time uh, something like this has occurred there. And I think the government really has to put their foot down and make it known that uh, that type of material is unacceptable. Well, I'd agree with uh, Conservative, Progressive Conservative MPP Lisa McLeod that the government should make sure everyone knows it's unacceptable, but hey, some of it's in other places. Some of it's going to be in the curriculum Kathleen Wynne wants to bring back. You know, back when we trusted educators more, we looked to the saying, give me the child and I'll give you the man. And we thought, yeah, yeah, that's the way it should be. Well, today we give our children over the school system and too often it seems intent on destroying them. At the Toronto District School Board in the past, we've talked about their veggie sex program. If you don't recall, this was a website they recommended to, that the kids go to to get the real truth about sex. It was part of the, well, the curriculum on sex ed. The website told students how to engage with vegetables. The TDSB is also where we found the promotion of polyamory. I mean, who are we to judge any relationship? Mom and dad, pff, that's passe. Mom, mom and dad, now that's in. So are dad, mom and mom, or mom, mom and mom. I mean puts them all on equal footing. The school board was accused of promoting polygamy, and they said, oh, no, no, we're not doing that. Well, they were right. They weren't promoting polygamy. I mean, polygamy is all about a man having more than one wife. They would never promote such sexist practices. But they were promoting polyamory, the idea that you can love whoever you want in any number, and it's all equal to marriage. This came out at about the same time the TDSB was found to have posters in schools promoting cross-dressing and gender fluidity. Sure, you're a boy now, but you can be a girl later, and you can switch back again if you like. But none of this is as explicit as what I'm about to show you. I said earlier you should get the kids out of the room, and I mean it. Get them out. Now. Children should not see what I'll show you, but you should. We went back and forth on whether we'd even show this material, material that was posted in a classroom for seven months. But unless you see it, you won't believe it. Even still, we had to censor this. This is the first poster, and it's truly the most shocking. This was posted in a middle school on a classroom wall. We're talking grades 7 and 8, kids that are between the ages of 12 and 14. The difference here is that, well, we blurred out one of the words. The school did not. Now, I have a son that's in that age range. I know that he's heard that word. I know that he has used that word. I highly discourage him from using it, though. But this is a classroom with a poster asking, do you like to... The poster below it shows one man kneeling in front of another man apparently engaged in an act of fellatio. And we know that because the poster is all about how to give a good blowjob. It says so right there in plain words and at times very graphic words. The poster talks about deep throating and how to do it. And no, we're not talking about Watergate in this poster. These materials were produced by the AIDS Committee of Toronto. I'm not sure what they think is uh, age appropriate for this group, but 
or this material, but I would hope that it wouldn't be a grade seven class. This is a, however, this is um, a difficult situation for the family to be in. And we do work hand in hand with these families because we co-parent. That's the educa from the, uh, the Crayon Dad story, uh, and we keep showing you that as a warning. But as I said, today's warning is about a teacher. Faith Goldie joins us now for more on this. She's the one that brought the story to our attention and uh, has more details on this. Uh, uh, Faith, tell us which school this is. I said it's the Toronto District School Board, but tell us what school this is and what you know about this. Well, it's actually Delta Alternative. Uh, alternative schools are basically a subset of Toronto District School Board, but I should mention the fact that, number one, Delta is a senior school, which means it's just for grades 7 and 8. However, this alternative school is actually uh, hosted or, or, or takes place within a JK to grade 6 school called Mont Rose. Now, how this all came to my attention, uh, a person, he or she, who has uh, described themselves as a concerned parent reached out to Sun News exclusively uh, to me. And I got to tell you, Brian, when I saw the footage of the, these two posters up in a classroom, I thought, my first thought was, I need to confirm this. Because there is no way that this is happening within the school system. And when I reached out to the school, they would not answer any of my calls. They instead uh, deferred me over to the TDSB uh, spokesperson. You can see this is the original footage that was sent to me. It's clearly a classroom, not a staff room. And the TDSB spokesperson, Ryan Bird, uh, basically confirmed, yes, this poster was up in Delta. And to their credit, they have taken it down. And they've put the teacher on home assignment. But here's the clinch, uh, the clinger, if you will. Uh, it's been up for seven months, Brian. It's been there since October. So the question then becomes, uh, who knew about this? When did they know about it? Because the principal has since denied any sort of knowledge about these posters being there until basically Sun News reached out and asked them to confirm and or explain. Now, I should mention the fact that there are certain uh, guidelines to, uh, I suppose, prevent this sort of thing uh, from happening. But the, the point of the matter is, is that this teacher did not go through the proper vetting process. What you see there is from uh, the actual policy on distribution and display of materials for students and parents uh, and teachers uh, from external groups. Now, it says there the principal will be responsible and accountable for the approval process and distribution well, of materials. So, I mean, mm -hmm. those, are, those are pretty uh, accurate words, pretty direct words, responsible and accountable. Is this principal being responsible or accountable for this? What's the TDSB telling you? Well, now that what they're saying is that this teacher is under investigation, and I really press, well, shouldn't the principal also be under investigation since it's the principal's school? It, to me, it's uh, absurd that any rational person, uh, having been in a building for seven months, could not see this. Now, I want to share with you, we did talk to Ryan Bird, spokesperson for TDSB, and he says basically this is the messaging coming out of the school that he parlayed to us. The teacher... Well, he was a well-meaning guy that just crossed some metaphorical line of the sand. If we could take a look at that clip. The uh, spirit behind putting these resources, these pamphlets up on the wall, was to have that real conversation about a real issue that is facing kids. But as I said, uh, there's a way to do that, and this was not that way. It was an inappropriate uh, pamphlet to put up on the, on the board. Again, I think it was is good intentions on behalf of the teacher to, I guess, uh, speak more real about an, a real issue that kids do face. Um, but again, it, it crossed the line, and that's why it's come down. Uh, it's difficult to try and uh, defend an irrational act like this, a per personally a perverted yeah. act like this, being a rational human being. He said, he cited privacy and said he cannot reveal the name because, wait for it, no disciplinary action has yet been taken. If we could take a look at that clip as well. Because at this point in time, there has been no disciplinary action taken. A home assignment is not a disciplinary action. It is merely uh, someone being put on home assignment pending the outcome of investigation. Uh, similar to uh, a court proceeding, the fact is you're innocent until proven guilty. Okay, well, so in my, you know, I agree. You're innocent until proven guilty, Faith, but it's your classroom. It's the materials on your wall. You put it up. You're guilty. By now... You know probably about the obscene poster that was placed in a school full of 12 and 13 year olds graphically depicting two men engaging in oral sex with detailed instructions on how to perform fellatio and another pamphlet with a caption in large, large letters, if you like to, and then the F word. Now, before you accuse me of homophobia, my criticism has nothing to do with the fact that this material was about gay sex. 
if it had been a postography depicting how to perform heterosexual sexual activities, it would still be just as inappropriate. Look, sex ed is one thing, but it's not supposed to be skills training. Even the group that printed the material in the first place quickly admitted that it was never intended to be in the classroom, never for classroom education. Now, these posters have been on the wall of this particular class for seven months now, and no other teacher, nor the principal, thought it inappropriate. Remember, this so-called alternative school is located in another school for very young children, as young as J.K., and they would go into the class too. Look, it's difficult to believe that the principal didn't see it. If so, what sort of a principal is he? $140,000 a year of public money, was that well spent, sir? Uh, frankly, this is not unique, and if you have kids in public schools, you will have heard other similar, if not precisely identical, tales. But at least, surely, certainly, once all this is exposed, more sensible people will prevail and common sense will drive out this perversion and indoctrination. So who better to interview than Chris Bolton, the school trustee for the area, and also, apparently, the, the chair of the Toronto District School Board. Okay, perfect. And our very own Karen Lieberman spoke to him and asked, what he thought. I think we need to have a conversation uh, with the community of Delta, which we will do, uh, and, uh, and probably we, we should have had a conversation with them beforehand, before the, before the document was, was, uh, was put up. I'm just wondering... Conversation. So, sorry, what conversation? There's right and there's wrong. There's good and bad, appropriate and inappropriate. Children go to school to be taught. They can be challenged, sure, certainly, but, but to sit in a classroom dominated by a large picture of a man performing oral sex and instructions on how to do the bloody thing properly? Karen then asks how this could have happened in the first place. The process is usually that materials are vetted through the, vetted through the principal. Um, when you have people, and we have many young teachers in the system, uh, sometimes things happen, and as I say, I think we, we, he, ourselves, the school, learn from it. Vetted, things happen, young teacher, oh good lord man, this was there for seven months. Come on. Karen then asked if Bolton thought the material acceptable. I think without, uh, without proper introduction of any materials, this material, I would suggest, is probably a little, uh, is overage. ACT actually suggested that this was adult material. I personally would agree with that. But, you know, one of the things that we try to do with our communities is to be able to judge what it is that they as a community, uh, uh, an adult community, parents uh, n would, would suggest suggest in the school uh, and in the classroom of their children. No, you don't. No, you don't. You're not trying to reflect, but to shape the culture, usually in your own image, and according to your own politics and your social ambitions. This is why kids go to anti-government marches, why they support teachers who go on strike, why you pay, don't you, enormous amounts of money for David Suzuki, Stephen Lewis, Justin Trudeau to come in and speak. So, Mr. Politician, what, uh, what would you tell an angry, disappointed, outraged parent? What I am going to do in conjunction with the, with the uh, superintendent of schools is to have a meeting with the families, uh, hear what they have to say, explain sort of what, what the facts of the situation are as we know them now. Uh, the material has been, has been removed. And so then we go forward and say, okay, what do you as the community want? Unlike what the Conservative member suggested, I would argue that our programs should be reflective of the communities in which they're placed. And without the community's input, I don't think we should be going forward. <laughs> He's talking about Lisa McLeod, a Conservative politician who criticised him, and she was completely right. That wasn't an answer at all, and it's entirely typical. And what is happening? I'd like to know, what is happening to this teacher who did this. Uh, according to you, he had to have the material vetted, and he didn't, and it's been up there now for seven months.
there is an investigation, uh, you know, until the investigation is over, I, 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 I can't say what's going to be happening. Well, I can. He's still being paid with your money, my money, our money at home. This independent filmmaker, and uh, they now call them occasional, is it occasional teachers? It used to be substitute teachers. Sorry, this is spin. This is condescending, patronizing spin. I don't believe this went under the radar, actually, but I do believe that there is support for this sort of trash in many activist and senior areas within public education. Not the majority, not the good, hard-working teachers. I'm not saying that, but amongst those who want not to teach kids, but to tell them and to tell you what to do and how to behave. You know, you've been uh, the night scrawler. You, you covered the overnight stuff for the Toronto Sun. You have seen a lot of weird things as a reporter. Did this still shock you? It did, because uh, nobody with any class as an adult would ever expose children to something like this, uh, whatever bent you come from. Uh, even the swear word alone uh, wouldn't be acceptable in a classroom. So, you know, they can cover it up and call it a one-off and all that kind of stuff. But you and I, and I've been on your show before. In fact, you've helped uh, send leads along to me, Brian. This is a rampant situation. Uh, what they're trying to do is pro uh, procure young people into this uh, lifestyle and it's, uh, it's a disgrace and we all know what it is and they're not going to be able to well, fool us. And, and let's just make this clear. When you say they're trying to procure people into Somebody the lifestyle, is. you're not talking specifically about homosexuality. You're talking about explicit sexuality of where people are trying to say, hey, everything's okay. Look, Veggie there's... sex is okay. Anything goes. Right. That's exactly what I'm saying is that they're trying to recruit and groom people for this lifestyle. And I say they, right. I don't mean the entire school board, but people within it that have power within it. Listen, right. when this happened, uh, you know, you brought it out last night on your show, and they're lucky that the hockey game was on and there's different things like that, but this is very serious. And good for you and for the Toronto Sun, Terry Davidson and Faith Goldie for, for doing this story. I'm gonna follow it up as well as I've done before with the veggie sex and all these other crazy things, transgender, many other things. And at the end of the day, they didn't want to come out and deal with it. They only deal with it because they're forced to. And they're not fooling anybody. And listen, the other thing, Brian, that's really important is how much tax dollars went into creating that pamphlet. And the information that I'm receiving is over $2 million. So it's your tax uh, money. Uh, $2 too. million dollars for that pamphlet? For that program. Okay, look, I don't... Considering the use that the AIDS Committee of Toronto said that that pamphlet was for and who it was intended for, the language, fine. You want to put that up in a nightclub, whatever, not my cup of tea, but you don't put it in a school. And even they said you don't put it in a school. Look, uh, Chris Bolton is the head trustee. He's the chair of the board at the Toronto District School Board. He was on uh, right now with Karen Lieberman earlier today. I want to play you a clip because I was shocked that he was just asked, you know, is this inappropriate? In my opinion, couldn't even give a direct answer. Here he is. Would you agree, Chris, that in this situation, that this material was inappropriate for grade seven and eight students? I think without, I think without, uh, without proper introduction of any materials, this material, I would suggest, is probably a little, uh, is overage. ACT actually suggested that this was adult material. I personally would agree with that. But, you know, one of the things that we try to do with our communities is to be able to judge what it is that they as a community, uh, uh, an adult community, parents uh, would, would suggest in the school uh, and in the classroom of their children. Okay, you want to know why these problems keep coming up, Joe, in the Toronto District School Board? That's why. Complete relativism. And it's he, wrong. He's in charge of the futures of our children. And... You know, there it is, right there. I mean, an incredible clip. I didn't know about it. I've got to get my hands on that clip and, and get the uh, transcript of it. But I'm not surprised that that's the way he thinks. Listen, this is the same guy they tried to cover for uh, Chris Spence, who was uh, plagiarizing and all that story, too, and all the other things that we've described. Listen, he should go. The whole hierarchy should be fired. This teacher should be fired. And there should be proper people put in place to make sure that the kids are getting the proper uh, education. It, a sex ed overhaul in Ontario has some parents riled up over new explicit content, like teaching grade seven students, 12 year olds, about oral and anal sex. One parent group website says it all. 
stopcorruptingchildren.ca. But the government, which sought input from public and Catholic schools, parents and public health, says clear language in the classroom is better than uniform chatter on the playground. Here's a rundown of the biggest changes. Grade threes will be learning about gender identity and sexual orientation, reflecting the increasing number of same-sex parents. Puberty will be introduced in grade four, one year earlier than in the old curriculum. Grade sixes will learn about masturbation and wet dreams, and grade sevens will learn ways to prevent pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, and as mentioned, be introduced to terms like anal intercourse and vaginal lubrication. Awkward. Okay, let's start this one with a warning. What follows could be disturbing to children and to normal adults, for that matter. Uh, we mentioned it last week briefly, but in Sudbury, Ontario, leaflets giving graphic descriptions on how to perform oral sex, whatever that is, were distributed to children as young as 12 years old. A Catholic school, by the way. Now, joining, me, joining me now is Joanne McGarry, Executive uh, Director of the Catholic Civil Rights League. Good Lord. I mean, you've read these things. I, yes, I did. I mean, I, again, people need to be warned, but I, I need to explain what this really says. It doesn't say, you know, don't do this. It explains how to do it. Um, giving and getting oral sex puts you um, uh, at the risk of getting HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. So here's how to do it. Oral sex is considered a low-risk activity. Um, you're a bit more at risk when you give oral sex than when you get it. And it goes on with the graphic details of how to give pleasure, both for men and women, boys and girls, giving oral sex. Um, lots of references to, to blood, semen, vaginal fluids, and uh, no one likes the taste of latex, it says. And how true that is, darling. Um, the, I mean, it just... At a Catholic school? It's outrageous. There's no other way to describe the... Well, how did it... How, how was it allowed? Well, um, you know, when, when you, you first contacted me about this, and I thought, well... You know, mistakes happen in all organizations. Yeah. There's lack of oversight. It was probably a busy day. People were dropping things off at various booths. <laughs> That's not really the point. Like, why would such a pamphlet exist in the first place yeah. for distribution in a school? Yeah. This is not a case of saying, you know, disease prevention is important. Yeah. Here are some things that you should know. It goes much farther than that into, um, as you just indicated, in, into territory that wouldn't be out of place in a soft porn manual. Well, I agree, I agree completely. and We're not overreacting here. Mm -hmm. uh, mouthwash and other breath fresheners can dry out the delicate skin in your mouth and throat. And it talks about how, again, I mean, I'm sorry to people who are offended by this, but if I don't mention it, how are you going to know how bad it is about b being careful with, uh, with the use of teeth? Because it, it, might, uh, it might somehow diminish the pleasure of, of the boy. Um, now, maybe kids as young as 12 weren't meant to see this, but they knew that kids as young as 12 were there. But even if they're 13, 14, 15, first of all, I've got four kids. Believe me, kids know pretty much everything anyway. They don't have to be told about this stuff. They know far more than older people. I think this is very, it, it's, it's tendentious, it's didactic. It's, it's trying to say to kids, this is okay. This is legitimate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree, and that's exactly the reason why it should not be in school. I, I understand one of the... Um, the uh, spokespersons at the company, that, at the organization that produced the pamphlet yeah. said, well, you know, she could get it on the internet, she could get it at the public health office. It didn't happen on the internet. It didn't no. happen in a public health office. Um, when you send your kids to school, um, yeah. particularly a Catholic school, uh, you expect that uh, there, there won't be this sort of material available. Yeah. Stripping away parental rights with a government force down on the education system. That is the topic of tonight's byline. You heard me say off the top that I must be a psychic. Well, I have a confession for you folks. I don't really believe in psychics, or perhaps I should say that I didn't, but I do now. What happened? Well, back during the Ontario election, I said a lot of things about the looming return of a graphic sex ed curriculum and that the McGuinty government would force Catholic schools to set up gay-straight alliance clubs. I was mocked. I was called a homophobe. I was told, calm down. This isn't on the agenda. Lily, they said, you're making stuff up. Well, now Ontario's new education minister has given an interview to Extra. That's the gay and lesbian newspaper. And she said all those things that I told you about. And that they're about to come true. So maybe, just maybe, I'm a psychic. Or maybe Minister Laurel Broughton is a homophobe. That could be the case. Probably not, though. She made these comments to Extra, not to me. 
I'll get to Broughton's comments in a minute, but let's remember why I said what I said. Basically, I just looked at what the McGinty liberals were saying. Glenn Murray spoke to the same newspaper, Extra, back in February and told them the sex ed curriculum was coming back and that only knuckle-draggers had pushed it back the last time in spring 2010. He said, the right-winged reactionary homophobes just love these issues. That's right, Glenn. I'm a homophobe and a reactionary because I opposed a curriculum that would have taught kids in grade three about transgenderism and gender fluidity, this idea that we all float from one gender to the next. Yeah, I'm a homophobe because I oppose teaching kids in school how to masturbate in grade six and how to perform oral and anal sex in grade seven. That's what was in the curriculum that pushed back that parents said, no, I don't think this is age appropriate. I don't think this is what I want you teaching my kids. Some of them just said, we don't want you teaching them in those grades. And by the way, don't tell me that they wouldn't be teaching kids how to do oral and anal sex. The curriculum called for kids to be taught how to do these things safely. How can you teach kids to do this safely unless you teach them how to do it in the first place? I also looked at what another McGinty cabinet minister said. Kathleen Wynne, again, in speaking to Extra, she was the former education minister that pushed for the gay straight alliance clubs in the first place. Well, she talked to Extra about the issue of Catholic schools refusing GSAs. Here's what she said. She said, I'm very disappointed by Catholic school boards' refusals to allow GSAs. When I was Minister of Education, I made it clear to directors that in the publicly funded Ontario education system, it was extremely important that we had equitable policies in all of our boards across the province. And I think that's well understood. Really? That's what she wanted to push forward? The Catholic schools in Ontario, by the way, have proposed that they include same-sex orientation and attraction in their overall anti-bullying campaign, one that attempts to end all bullying. They're being told that's not good enough. No, it's got to be a school or a club just for gay and lesbian students. Now let me get to Broughton's comments. Again, to extra. Do you notice this? They, they say one thing to the rest of the media and then one thing to extra? Well, on the sex ed curriculum, she said this. She said, there's been so much misinformation and outright lies about sex ed. The misinformation has been put out in a very homophobic way. I have been very clear that is not acceptable. I called upon Tim Hudak to apologize for using information that was totally inaccurate for the purpose to divide Ontarians. Hey, Laurel, you're dividing Ontarians. Here's a challenge to you, Ms. Broughton. I want you to come on my show. You don't have to sit next to me. You can come on from Toronto. Uh, but I want you to come on my show and explain to me how opposing this graphic sex ed curriculum is homophobic. I want you to tell me what the lies are, because I pulled my material straight out of the curriculum. And guess what? Those ads that everyone's complaining about have pretty much done the same thing. As for gay straight alliances in Catholic schools, Broughton was asked about a document on how Catholic schools should deal with students with same sex attraction. It was put out by Catholic bishops. That document is called Pastoral Guidelines to Assist Students of Same Sex Orientation. It makes clear that students dealing with same sex attrac attraction should not be discriminated against, that they should be shown love and compassion. But the document also says, as does all Catholic teaching, that this is wrong. They also say divorce is wrong, and that sex before marriage is wrong, and that sex outside of marriage, period, is wrong. But because the document doesn't ce celebrate homosexuality, Extra thinks it's wrong. They say it is reviled, and they've asked for it to be removed. Here's what Broughton said when asked if she would remove it. I clearly and completely understand why that document is not acceptable to many, many Ontarians. Ms. Broughton? Catholic schools have the right to teach their faith and not have the government dictate what that faith is or how it should be practiced. That is literally what they do in China. The Chinese government controls the churches and tells them what they can think. And again, maybe this is part of McGinty's plan. Across the school system, he has taken away parental input, parental choice, and put radicals in charge of the curriculum. It's time to take back control. Parents are the first educators of their children and remain so throughout the child's life. 
McGinty should be listening to parents on these issues, not taking marching orders from activists at Extra. Uh, to me, this is, you know, it's being put forward in the name of diversity, but it's diversity through enforced uniformity. We're going to claim this is about diversity and make you all think exactly the same thing. We've been telling you the story of a grade 7 class in St. Albert, Alberta, a suburb of Edmonton. We've been telling you on my chorus radio show and here on TV, where a teacher decided to show 12-year-olds a sexual harassment video, albeit a spoof. Yes, it was created as a joke, not meant for kids at all. One filled with highly sexualized dialogue, F-bombs going off, amongst a lot of other very inappropriate language and visuals. The sexual harassment video became a form of sexual harassment. Steve, uh, there was an important meeting last night, a meeting that was supposed to be uh, information, a meeting that uh, was supposed to make all of the parents feel better about things going forward. Tell us about the meeting that took place, who called it and, and what happened? Well, the superintendent called the meeting and the deputy superintendent were there and with the, fa with the, the parents of the kids and, and most of the parents I think were there. Um, we really didn't get any information at this meeting. We were told that they were going to discipline them. And the teacher, they didn't really um, talk about um, how they were going to discipline them. They wouldn't give us any of that information. Uh, they said they have conducted an, uh, an investigation, and then now this uh, teacher is going to be back in the school in January. And uh, that's kind of all the information that came out of, out of the meeting from their side. There was a lot of concerned parents there that were asking, they were asking the questions of um, this gentleman's past, and one, one particular um, father that, uh, that has come, come up with some, some stuff that may be questionable about other things that have happened with this teacher, and now it's just this rumor mill and that we can't let that happen. It's gotta, these guys have to come to the table and tell us the truth, open up their investigation and let us see exactly what's going on with this teacher before they let him back in that classroom. You know, it's amazing. In, de in dealing with uh, school officials and dealing with uh, that particular uh, school division, uh, all we've gotten is uh, stonewall after stonewall after stonewall. They don't want to come on the air. Uh, they're concerned that the name of the school will be mentioned. That's their, their major problem. WD Cuts Junior High. Uh, we mentioned the name of the school because we didn't want to impugn every other school in Alberta. We just didn't sure. want to say a generic school. And then, of course, uh, what they're most concerned about is that we'll talk about specific rumors or rumors or what have you. Uh, in, in the uh, correspondence that we got from them, even a threat. Uh, to sue us uh, if we discuss rumors, uh, saying that uh, to, to, to spread rumors is to engage in defamation. But the, the, the problem I have with this is, because they're not giving information, because they are not being accountable, uh, because uh, they is are why not the rumors being... Are there. That, that, that's what create, sure. they are creating the rumors, and it just Absolutely boggles my mind that these are, these are educators, they are conducting a clinic in how to make something that is potentially not very large, enormous. In, absolutely. And they're, they're basically saying that they're going to do it their way and they're going to keep it as quiet as they can. And let's remember, this teacher thought that most of this material, except for one of these sketches, was appropriate. The fact that he thought for a second that anything in this video was appropriate tells me that we're so far apart in our views that there's no way this teacher is going to get in and be teaching my, my child. It's not going to happen. Well, of course, there's, a, there's a huge issue there with judgment, and every single parent wants to know what other judgments has he made in the past. It's a sure. normal question. It's a natural question. And I don't yeah. understand why the school division wouldn't be more transparent about this if for no other reason, I mean, aside from the obvious important reason of uh, safety mm -hmm. for the children, but for their own, uh, for, for their own integrity, for their own reputation. Sure. And, and there, it's just not happening. But we've, you know, they've, they've all lawyered up here. They've, the teacher's got a lawyer. The school's got their lawyers. So we're going to have to do the same thing. And we'll just take it to this next step and, and see what we have to do until uh, we get them to, to do what is appropriate in, in something that, you know, should never have happened. Okay. When everybody's lawyered up like this, does it not create the impression in the community that something very, very important is being covered up and whatever it is is not very good? You would, you would certainly think so, and, and people need to pay attention. They need to go and watch that video, and they need to get upset about it so that we can force this change, because the way this system is stonewalling 
um, uh, this, uh, my kids' education and me having to come in and push as hard as I'm pushing to get them to just do what's right or at least admit what's right. They they just refusing to stay out of it completely, and they can't parent. They can't they can't uh, school my children when they can't even communicate with me. They've they've got to correct this and they've got to make sure that that teacher stays out of the classroom. Okay, universities have always been places to learn new things, meet new people, expand your horizons. You can do all three at the University of Toronto Sexual Education Center's Epic Sex Club Adventure next Monday. U of T students can join their friends at the Oasis Aqua Lounge for an intro to the sex club scene in Toronto. Clothing is optional and public sex is permissible, except in the tub, as in hot tub. Only five bucks and a valid student ID needed for admission. Don't worry. Everything is sanitary, contraceptives readily available. Are you really surprised? Well, this is happening in the same city whose largest school board provided K-12 through students with links to websites encouraging them to experiment sexually with vegetables. So please, don't be shocked. I'm not against responsible sex ed. Quite to the contrary. But that's got nothing to do with this. Why is there so much sex ed these days and not enough ed about everything else. One example comes from Memorial University, that's in Newfoundland. A professor, Judith Adler, uh, not, not, not family, which she was. She discovered that 75% of her students couldn't identify the continents or even the world's major oceans, including the Atlantic Ocean, which they are on. 75% of university students, and that was after Professor Adler gave up asking them to identify countries. Now, let me read it. The University of Tirana Sexual Education Center, SEC, is kicking off its annual sexual awareness uh, week. Just, you're just away for a week, that's all. Sexual Awareness Week um, at Oasis Aqua Lounge, where swingers are welcome and sex is allowed everywhere but the hot tub, because that's a bit messy. The organization rented the club and lowered the price to $5 a person. That's not bad. Admission for couples is normally $80. U of T is holding an orgy and you're invited. You just need your student ID or one Reddit user posted in the University of Waterloo forum. Explain, please, young woman. <laughs> you, know, you went me. to U of T. I did, actually. That's yeah. just my alma mater. Um, you know, shame on the university, as far as I'm concerned. It's an institution for higher learning. Um, just about every U of T student that I can call to mind right now that I ever came into contact with would, would not be caught dead at one of these events because they actually have plans for their future. They understand the risk of someone perhaps videotaping, taking these uh, picture phones. And hold on, there's this other risk. I believe it's called STDs. Yeah. Um, you know, I checked through all the Facebook events planned for this group, this sexual education center at UFT. Not one of them on STDs or STIs. As far as I still know, I, I know AIDS is still a killer. Uh, no, but instead they've offered several different um, courses such as BDSM for beginners. Now, I didn't know what those st stood for. It's bondage, discipline, and sad uh, sadism yeah. and masochism. I knew but, that. Oh, uh, no, okay, oh. I didn't know what that was. Okay, I, and I was afraid to ask Karen Lieberman, who sits British. beside me, okay? Uh, what, Did Karen know? Uh, I, no, I didn't ask her. I didn't have the heart to because I knew it was something girl. not... No, stop it. Okay, uh, but look, uh, this is all to say what? Sexual education is important. Uh, sexual ed ed education is that... Uh, I think it is with respect oh, to... You go to university and you're not aware of, of this is procreation, this is what goes where, and these are the, the possible problems. Oh, come on. I, I, 100% Michael, but I think that if that's going to be offered at the university, it's justifiable. Uh, uh, however, uh, BDSM for beginners, um, uh, uh, and uh, make no mistake that this is part of a larger trend. I spent my first year at um, at University of Western Ontario, and I want to share this with our viewers because I don't think they know about how um, uh, just disgusting a lot of this agenda is and how prevalent it is within university society. That lady from Sex with Sue, Sue, was our you know inaugural speaker oh, the one who looks uh, like during a, a Frost raisin. Week. Yeah, and it's yeah. over 70 years old, and I actually had to sit there during yeah. Frost Week events and watch her um, put a condom on a dildo with her mouth. Uh, forgive me for oh, saying this. Oh, good lord! That is what is out that there. Is that is what is happening images. to your children at university. A 75-year-old raisin putting a condom on a dildo yeah. with her mouth. Uh. Wake up, folks. This is oh, very, very, God. very real. And I'm sorry for seeing this on air, but it, it, it's true. And this part, a sexual club, okay, a group, a club where, oh, but don't worry about it, because uh, as Tower, the group uh, executive says, uh, he says, uh, the club is four stories of easy to clean surfaces with sanitizing wipes, right. uh, a basket of condoms, and lots of places to mingle, including a back of a hippie van and a heated pool. Well, charming. Nothing says love more than, than Lysol on a condom. Now, 
Do they get funding from the university? This is the way that it works. Technically, this event is not being funded by the university, but it is being co-funded. Obviously, you just talked about that discrepancy between $80 and the $5 that right. they're being charged with by the group. With Sexual Awareness Week, the Toronto Sexual Education Centre, they must get funding. They do. $0.25 cents per semester per a student, which is, uh, they can't opt out. If I were still at the How university... How students at Oh, I don't know. 10,000? Uh, well over that, yeah, for so sure. So you're, you're talking about... Uh, two and a half, three grand. I mean, well, no, more than that. You're talking about a lot of money. Yes. Uh, of public money going to this group here who want to, to heavily subsidize, and there will be some who go along. I mean, I'm not here to characterize drunken engineering students, for example, but there are some people, particularly guys, who will go along on public money to, to, for, for, for cheap and potentially dangerous Well, sex. it was funny, you know, I was reading through the Facebook page and they said, you know, it's going to be an 80 to 1 guy to girl ratio that shows up and then someone else kind of uh, went in, well, that's why it's usually a couples only thing where you're supposed to go with your significant other. Yeah. So I think that'll turn out to be perhaps a bit of a, la a laughing uh, stock. <laughs> Pro-life clubs, for example, I'm not going on about the abortion issue, I don't care what your views are, but pro-life clubs are being banned in about a dozen different universities now, and yet money will go to the Toronto Sexual Education Centre so they can have orgies at a local strip club. Yeah, and Michael, this is part of um, the new uh, foolish fad that is going on not only in universities but across the country. Yeah. Uh, right now, their goal here is sex positivity, is what they call it, and this is from the executive itself. It is about coexisting and not having disagreements about what is morally right or appropriate. This is anti-knowledge, and this runs against what every other generation before our generation, my generation, um, uh, has, has come to preach. Which is treating Treating women like pieces of meat is immoral. Mm -hmm. Sex is a wonderful thing. It's meant to be, if at all possible, love is meant to be part of this. Children conceived in an Pleasure act of love. Pleasure is a byproduct of sex, Michael. Of it's course. supposed to be for procreation. None of that is part of this dialogue. Mm. They, they, they build up this dishonest uh, depiction of people who are against them being frightened of sex. Or it, I find it fascinating that you go to, to you see demonstrations of people who are, who are Christian or, or more. They've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve children. They're apparently frightened of sex. And the ones who are really sexually liberated have 1.2 children, and they all seem rather upset the whole time. For goodness sake, what is wrong with this picture? It, uh, this is a disgrace, but you know what? I suspect nothing will change. Mm -hmm. As always... Now, Faith, uh, I had to do a double take. I thought I was reading satire, uh, but... The no. Onion, maybe. Yes, The Onion. Um, University of Toronto is kicking off something tonight at the Oasis Aqua Lounge in Toronto called Sexual Awareness Week. And basically, it's being promoted as they're going to have this, I guess, an orgy. And I went to a website uh, that described Oasis. This is the description verbatim, Faith. Four stories of easy-to-clean surfaces with sanitizing wipes, baskets of condoms, and lots of places to mingle. There are rules and etiquette, but no judgment. Some people may wish to have sex. Some may only want to watch other people having sex. Some people come as a group and have sex with each other. Oh, and sex is allowed everywhere but the hot tub. I guess that would be quite messy. Something called Sexual Awareness Week, which just seems to be some kind of glorified orgy. Well, what's going on? Yeah, uh, back in the day when your student ID could perhaps get you a discount at Foot Locker, now get you a discount at a sex club downtown <laughs> Toronto. <laughs> Quite literally, true. usually it's $80 per couple, now it's $5 per person, and you can bring a friend. Well, this is being subsidized then, uh, right, by right. student fees? Uh, right, uh, student fees, uh, 25 cents per semester per a, uh, a student there, and um, that money is going towards events such as this, apparently. And as far as I'm concerned, shame on the university. Mm. Uh, shame on the university for not so much censoring the group, uh, not censoring the group, I should say, but not condemning them. I, I really think that that would have been the appropriate, um, uh, basically, uh, way for the, 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 the university to, you know, deal with the fact that, hey, they're a place of higher education. Right. What is going on here? That students, they said, bring your student ID card. Well, some students are 18 years old, are going to be participating in an orgy. And the executive, um, the man on the executive said, this is my alma mater, by the way. That's um, right. You graduated there last year, U of T, correct? I did graduate okay. from U of T last year. And now, um, the executive there said, look, we're not having an orgy. We're not, um, we're not pushing people to have sex. Well, you're going to a place that has these self-described, you know, easy to wipe surfaces and baskets full of condoms. And at six o'clock um, in the evening, the group has said, we, we encourage people to take their clothes off. You're going there for a slice of pizza and a movie? I, I'm confused <laughs> about what's going on. Look, as far as I'm concerned... But you know, uh, really, from the description, it looks like a 
just a bunch of people getting involved in sexual acts. I mean, there there seems to be very little education. And, and perverse sexual acts. Uh, let's be very clear. I went through all of the Facebook events that were listed. Not one on healthy relationships. Not one on, you know, sex for the sake of, oh, I don't know, say procreation. Not one on STDs. Last time I checked, AIDS is still a killer. Mm -hmm. um, what there was was BDSM for beginners, the screening of a movie uh, called Phone Whore about some call girl, um, and uh, pornography sessions. This is not sexual education as far as I'm concerned. This is sexual re-education. And what it does is it completely, they want to push something called uh, uh, sexual positivity, where people don't judge, there's no right or wrong. What it does is it pushes this moral relativity and a complete break from what every other age in history has taught us, is that there is a right, there is a wrong, sex for the sake of uh, procreation, and hey, pleasure is a byproduct of that. And starting tomorrow, the Ottawa Museum opens its sex, a tell-all exhibition to the public and to school groups. They say it's an educational exhibit, and it's meant for parents, educators, and adolescents, 16 and up. But what exactly is this racy exhibition teaching kids? For more, here's Chris Sims, live in Ottawa. Chris? Hello there, Sneha. It must be very clear, when this was first uh, being opened here in Ottawa, it was aimed at 12 and up. And I don't know about you, but there's a world of difference in my end of the world between 12 and 16. So initially this was aimed at 12-year-old kids, so that's grade 6, grade 7, and a little bit older. Now they've bumped it to age 16. They say it's educational. I went and saw it yesterday, and while yes, there are some educational elements, you know, they give you rates about STIs, uh, sexually transmitted infections, condom use, that sort of thing, it is set up in such a way that it's, it's racy, it's, it's arty, it's frankly set up to titillate. There's even a room called the Climax Room, and I will try to be very sparing with my language, but there is a low, round leather bed, and there's, you know, kind of backlit red curtains surrounding it, and it's aimed at this video screen, which shows what happens when that word is used, and there's also audio attached to it. So if anybody thought that that was cool for their 12-year-old, uh, I don't know very many people to think that's okay. 16, you know, leave it up to the parents with that one. But yeah, this was billed as something for kids, you know, kids 12 and up, uh, and especially for schools. There's a whole, there's even a teacher's guide on how to do proper quizzes afterwards and have fun games when you're finished looking at this display at the Ottawa Science and Tech Museum. And it must be clear, um, I've got a membership to the museum, and up until now, it has been about nuts and bolts. It's been about, you know, space age stuff, how the telephone works, uh, digital technology, all that sort of thing. This is definitely a change. It's a sex exhibition in Ottawa, and uh, must emphasize this, your money's involved here. So uh, videos of, of kids masturbating, pictures of people having sex, <laughs> all good, clean fun in contemporary Canada. Uh, Patrick Meir went to see it for some reason. I've got to find that out first. He's in Ottawa. Uh, why did you go to see this? A friend of mine uh, sent me an email. He said, uh, go check this out, see uh, whether it's something that uh, we should be concerned about. I went with my wife, and uh, I must say, if uh, my wife had gone alone and come back and told me what she had seen, I would have told her she was exaggerating. Right. I, I couldn't believe what I saw. I, I took notes. I passed it around to friends. It was disgusting. Okay. So, hold on. Uh, you only looked at pornography for matters of research. Have I heard that before somewhere? Anyway, it doesn't... <laughs> but yeah. is it... I mean, I haven't seen it. I, I've written about it. Yeah. And I've spoken to various people who have been there. Uh, and again, if, if people are watching, they're offended by this. We have to be explicit. Otherwise, how can we tell you what's really going on? Videos of kids masturbating. Yes, it was an animated video of uh, a boy and a girl masturbating, it was uh, close-ups, and of what I understand is that as of yesterday, due to all, to all of the complaints, that part of the exhibit has been yanked. And how, so to speak, and how, how, uh, how young were these children? Uh, well, you can't tell because it's, uh, they're headless. Yeah. So it's, there's no way of knowing. But from their bodies, they're, they're, they're quite uh, young? They're, they're teenagers, I would right. say. Now, uh, let's be uh, quite realistic here. Throughout the history of humanity, uh, children have not really had an enormous problem finding out about uh, what masturbation is. Uh, it, we can have an objection to it, but it's entirely natural that they would understand what it is. W what is the premise behind showing these videos? What's the reason? Well, to me, this is um, basically a sexual ideology 
that wants to uh, corrupt the minds of children. Well, what are they saying? I mean, they, they, I'm sure they don't put, I don't, no. it doesn't say, That's this right. is to corrupt the minds of children. What are they claiming the videos are for? What's well, the instructional value? Uh, what the uh, public relations uh, officer at the museum told me was that um, if you give this information to children at a younger age, they will avoid getting involved in sex until uh, a later age. What? Which, that's right. It just means they'll go blind earlier. That's what it means. <laughs> I mean, why do you think I wear bifocals, for goodness sake? Yes, well, I guess at the Science and Technology Museum, common sense is the least common of all senses. Quite, I mean, the way that they will lie like this. And yes. uh, Now, what else is there? There's some... And first of all, if adults... I mean, the, the, we have, a, we have a, not a huge, but we have a problem with child pornography. Yes. Uh, that there are particularly men, perverted men, who would go along to watch this and be aroused by it. I, I think that's possible, yes. And the, 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 there's no uh, attempt to prevent people who are breaking the law through child pornography to go to a publicly funded museum to see more of it? Uh, well, I mean, uh, it's, it's open to uh, anyone now over the age of 16. Yeah. Oh, let me ask you about that, because initially it was 12. Yes, uh, due to all the protests in the last uh, week, uh, my understanding is now they have raised the uh, age to uh, 16. And under the age of 16, you must be accompanied by an adult. Yeah, now this is very, very significant here, and people m must realize this, that when we do respond, you see, that th these elitists, they always assume that we're, we're the, the stupid rednecks who think, uh, have no original thought and so on, and we just react and we panic and we're hysterical. When we do respond to these zealots who are trying to, to take over our children, um, they do panic and they do react. Initially, it was 12. 12 years old. So kids could go at the age of 12... Uh, I mean, 12 years old, you might still believe in Santa. Of course, you are allowed to advise the President of the United States about marriage policy, but that, that, that's another issue. Yeah. What, what, what else did you see there? What, what other fun did they have in store? Well, there, was, uh, there were videos of people who talked about their sexual experiences. Yep. And in that, uh, there was a middle-aged woman talking about having uh, multiple partners. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another woman talking about how she has friends with benefits. And I've only recently realized, uh, learned that benefits means uh, you have friends who are not boyfriends or girlfriends yeah. with whom you share sexual favors. You've just got that, have you? Yes, I'm afraid so. I mean, there was a movie out. Not, I mean, at, anyway, <laughs> you're on the cutting edge, aren't you? Yes, okay, yes. so she, yeah, uh, what else? Uh, so there's also um, an exhibition which talks about uh, sexual orientation. They interview 12 people and not one is heterosexual. Right. Uh, and there's a sexologist who answers uh, about t uh, 10 questions, uh, encouraging uh, oral sex, also encouraging anal sex in, in a response to a question uh, which asks uh, why boys are interested in anal sex. The sexologist uh, says it's normal and that this could be fun for you. Uh, nowhere does it talk about uh, the hygiene involved in this. And uh, he goes on to talk about, uh, in another question, about uh, you know, love. Uh, should I uh, make love to this guy? How do I know he loves me? Well, the answer is all based on one's feelings. Right. Well, uh, anything else? Before, because we've only got a few seconds left. Anything else that was particularly delightful? Uh, well, there was a, an exhibit in which um, they talked about uh, body parts, uh, well, the private parts. Uh, C-O-C-K was used for male genitalia. P-U-S-S-Y for uh, female genitalia, and the visitor was asked to sit down at the station and type out their word for um, uh, male and female uh, private parts. Wedding tackle. I've said this many times. The appropriate clinical term is wedding tackle. Get it right. Well, it sounds a great deal of fun. Uh, I uh, won't be going. This should be closed down. The fact that they're backtracking now on age and the videos we know that they're wrong. They know they're wrong. It's how much pressure we, we can, we can yeah. force. And I said in the monologue, there are museums that honor the sacrifice of our fighting men and women against Nazism that can't afford to stay open. And this crap gets funding through the public and will apparently be open until next year, but not if we have anything to do. Yeah. Do stand up my wife enters the room, Carter. Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry. Ah, we'll take the foreplay as read, if you don't mind it. No, of course not, Hannah. Now, as the sexual excitement mounts, what's funny, Biggs?
Oh, nothing, sir. Oh, do please share your little joke with the rest of us. I mean, obviously, something frightfully funny is going on. Yeah, satire. Um, that was satire in uh, the 70s or early, early 80s when Monty Python put out The Meaning of Life and, you know, the idea that they would be physically showing you how to do sex ed uh, in class. We're almost at that point. We showed you the flyer yesterday about oral sex where they, they gave full-on descriptions in a pamphlet. Oral sex is when a person's mouth is used to play with another person's genitals. So to give someone oral sex, a person can lick, sick, blah, blah. You know, I don't want to read any more of this. But this is what they're handing out in classes. This is what they're handing out in classes. And this is part of an agenda, an agenda that parents need to know. And just quickly, before we get to our next guest, who it, it is related to education, I want to show you what they're putting up. This is from Woodruff High School. Those are tough to see, but I want to read out what some of them are. This is from the GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance of Woodruff High School here in Ottawa. What do you think causes your heterosexuality? Is, your, is it possible your heterosexuality is just a phrase you might, phase you might outgrow? If your best friend found out that you were heterosexual, how would they react? I know what they're trying to get at here, but this is more than what they promised these clubs would be about. So while all of this is going on, you know what they're not teaching in school, or at least not teaching properly? Math. They're not teaching how to do math, addition, subtraction, multiplication. They're not teaching kids how to read properly. They're not teaching them the basics of a good education. Finally, the creepy pictures of the girls for a French fashion line that wants to promote lingerie for young children. That's truly creepy, but maybe not as weird and creepy as the next topic. Uh, a conference designed to take the stigma out of being a pedophile, if I'm reading it correctly. The man here to help me read this all correctly, John Robson, Sun News commentator. John, am I figure th figuring this out right? A conference that's supported by a professor from Johns Hopkins University, there to say, don't worry, we don't want to stigmatize people that are attracted to children. The purpose of the conference, as far as I can determine, is to assist people with that uh, difficulty in seeking mental health assistance for that or other problems from therapists who will be willing to talk to them. And that, as far as it goes, seems to me is quite reasonable. Maybe they've but got other mental health issues that come from the fact that, that that isn't directly related to the fact that they're attracted to children. Or maybe even, according to this, is, has no relation to it, but they want to be able to be honest with the therapist. Having said that, though, there are a few things that worry me. And the first of those is that they insist upon using the term minor attracted people, which is one of those phrases that, in an attempt to take the stigma out of it, it seems to me takes the condemnation out of it. And I, I accept if someone has this kind of attraction, you that want them is to a get heavy help. burden to bear. You want you know, them to get help, not You know, not the Catholic to act on Church it. says there are many martyrs in secret, people who have that kind of feeling and never act on it. But... You want to love the sinner, not the sin. And to start talking as though the attraction itself was harmless, just one of those things, that it seems to me is a problem. And there are a few things in their literature of the organization arranging it. Some minor attracted people seek services to help them deal with issues that result from society's negative reactions to their sexual feelings, as though it's all the fault of society. No, it, it, this, as they say, people don't choose to be this way, and I, I grant you that. But if you are this way, you must understand that sexual interference with a child is a terrible thing to do, and you must never do it. And to you can get to the point where you're being so considerate in your language that you're actually steering around the fact that this is something you must never do, that it is a horribly wrong thing to engage in sexual activity with a child. Part of what the way I read it is that they want to remove this from the, um, the manual that psychiatrists use to determine whether somebody fits into certain categories, that that in itself makes it a, a, a stigmatized condition and we shouldn't do that that it's 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 bad to medicalize this well they say they just want to make sure it's a better definition because they say apparently the definition of pedophilia includes people who are feeling distressed about their attraction and that not all these people do feel distressed about their attraction and this is the point at which not meaning to sound uncompassionate but if you have these kind of feelings they should distress you you must recognize that these are not harmless it's not just a matter of different people having different tastes that sexual attraction to children is a constant invitation to do something evil and you although you may well say it's not my fault I feel this way and I would grant that but you must resist 
absolutely and always okay. any inclination to act on these feelings or to suggest that they are okay. And that's where the, this 10-year-old on the cover of Vogue and what is very clearly a highly sexualized pose and the kind of clothing and all the stuff that's going on out there, it is obtuse or worse to pretend that nothing is happening here. Clearly, there's a widespread impulse to sexualize childhood and to normalize the sexualization of childhood, and that cannot possibly be portrayed as innocent, nor can it be portrayed at this point as fringe. There's too much of it going on, and the rest of us must stand up and say, no, but this what, is how, not how a matter do, of being tolerant. This is a matter of being blind to evil. How do we do that? We've got these groups saying... You've got to let Ernie and Bert marry, which to me is sexualizing a children's program that doesn't need exactly. sexualizing. Exactly. It's not anti-gay. It's the children's program and children's characters. You've got the Paris Vogue. You've got the lingerie ads. You've got people constantly trying to sexualize children on the one hand from the entertainment industry, from the fashion industry, and then you've got the academic saying, oh, let's not stigmatize. It seems to me like a full-on cultural assault. And so how do you fight back? Well, the first thing is, if a store is selling that kind of stuff, you complain, and if they don't change their policy, you refuse to shop there. Never mind if it's convenient. Never mind if they carry other stuff you want. Take a stand for what you know is right. Don't buy magazines that put portray this kind of image and use it to sell their product. Refuse to be engaged with it. Refuse to be indifferent to it. Speak out against it. And I noticed there was one article about that Vogue, and there was one person early on who actually had made a comment about it that was quite favorable to the cover. And uh, this, I thought, was quite distressing. Somebody said, uh, average age of conception in the world is under 14. Just because it's weird to us doesn't mean it's wrong. But if there's one thing I love the French for, it's their pension for making their way to a line and then obliterating it. If I remember my history correctly, everyone else just skirts around it. But this is followed by a whole string of comments from people objecting, saying, I'm outraged, I'm not going to stand for this, and one person saying, I'll never buy that magazine again. You can absolutely use your power as a consumer and as a citizen to f strike back. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be afraid to be stigmatized yourself if you say this. So people say, oh, well, they used to talk that way about homosexuals, you know. Yeah, they did. We have now come to a better understanding of how one should feel about that. But... Everything is not the same as homosexuality. I noticed there's also a movement, I've been collecting notes on this, to legitimize incest. And, in fact, one of the problems is the same arguments that were used for other kinds of sexual liberation. Oh, well, it's love between consenting adults, who are we to object? The people who made that argument about gay marriage never thought to themselves, for some reason, where else might this lead? Polygamy, for a start. And then incest. How do you not apply that argument? They needed to find a different argument. And people were afraid to say, wait a minute, the logic of this is no good, because they're going to get called a homophobe. Well, well I don't called, be afraid I, of I, it. I, I said that your logic is no good. This will lead to polygamy and other things. And was called a homophobe. And you were called, so was I. You know, I won't be the start of Guess who's coming to dinner? It looks like Bob and Carol and Alice, but not Ted. And sure enough, this is some rumbling forward. But there are ways that you can make the argument that don't bring in this other forbidden territory that should remain forbidden. And we need to be able to stand up and say, I'm not afraid of being called a dirty name by some left winger. I know that cover of Vogue was wrong because it sexualized a child, and I am not going to be bullied out of saying that's yucky. Well, as I said earlier, it got Heather, and Ma Heather Malik and I agreeing on something, and that's difficult. That's difficult, but it can happen. It can happen. Now, this is important, and you know, I've been talking all week and, and part of last week about fighting back against the entitlement culture. I think this is the same thing. You've got to fight back. You've got to take a stand, and it, it, I, I think it includes not just saying, I won't shop at that store, or I won't buy that magazine, but also speaking up when you're talking to your friends or your family or your coworkers, and these sorts of things come up. You can just sit there and meekly be quiet and say, oh, well, you know, who am I to, to speak up as they talk about it uh, favorably about the sexualization of children and or children's lifestyles. But you just got to st stand up and say, this is wrong. It's creepy. It's got to stop. Yeah, I'm not afraid of being thought repressed. I'm not afraid of being thought old fashioned. I'm not afraid of using what may be stigmatized as old fashioned language about right and wrong. And exactly, I will not be intimidated even in private conversation. I know this is a bad thing. I know it is an important thing. I know it is not trivial. I'm not making a mountain out of a molehill here. This pervasive sexualization of children in advertising and in merchandising and in the arts and to some extent, as you said, in academia is a movement that will do huge harm if it is not stopped. And I am not going to be one of those who stood by and watched it happen. An article this morning in The Guardian, a liberal paper, the British version of the Toronto Star, 
by feature writer John Henley addresses misconceptions about paedophiles, quoting one expert who believes that, quote, it is the quality of the relationship that matters. And then the report goes on at great length to really try to normalize in some ways paedophilia. Barbara Kay joins us from Montreal. Barbara, this is terrifying stuff. Uh, yes, I agree, Michael. I, I think that when people start talking about quality of the relationship and all that sort of thing, uh, this is a cover-up for, uh, or they're trying to put a, a, a gloss on uh, their own kind of depraved instincts. Uh, and one of the words that they will often use, which I believe is used in this context, is continuum. Yeah. In other words, there's no, there's no objective right or wrong. Uh, this is about people's feelings, and as long as these are authentic feelings, we see a lot of buzzwords used in therapy. Uh, we have a very therapized culture, uh, but therapy is um, uh, very much the opposite of what people who believe in right and wrong, you know, uh, ac can accept. And uh, it's a very narcissistic way of looking at uh, relationships. Yes, it is. And it's very interesting where it's coming from. It's coming from certain uh, elements, aspects within the academy, academic circles, and a few people in media who seem to be their foot soldiers. They use terms like intergenerational sex rather than paedophilia. They talk, as you say, about a continuum, uh, that uh, we are sexual from birth onwards, and it depends on the age. And, and this is very important, the quality of. So they will argue that a child, seven, eight, nine, can give consent. Now, a child may say yes to something which is absolutely harmful to, to that child. Candy can change a child's opinion. And what they're saying in this report, and this report has some standing, and it was reiterated with approval in the Guardian newspaper, an important newspaper, international newspaper, they're saying that it's okay under some circumstances to rape children. Well, you're, you're quite right. And this whole idea that children can give consent uh, to uh, being seduced is so really terrible. Um, and I, I find that when newspapers start listening to academics, they, they get a, a sort of a glazed over, you know, the idea that somebody is an expert or that they have a PhD suddenly confers on them some kind of moral authority. But we know, Michael, that some of the worst ideas in history have come straight out of the academy. And in fact, most of the worst ideas in history, uh, nat nationalist socialism and uh, communism, uh, and all kinds of other dreadful ideas come straight out of the university. So that's the last place I would look uh, for a moral authority. Yes, exactly. Now, there is some origin in this. I, I suppose it would have been what the 1960s and the decade following when we said that if you felt any way, really, acting upon it was not bad or wrong. If you felt it, act upon it. Now, in some areas, that was acceptable. I mean, for example, we would criminalize homosexuality, which I think was inappropriate. But we kept pushing further and further and further. So it wasn't just gay people being liberated from maybe going to prison for their sexuality, which is obviously the, the wrong thing to do. It was saying, even if you feel attracted to someone who is very young, even if you're attracted to, to several people simultaneously, all of that is OK if you feel like it. And honestly, well, Barbara, I, I, I think within 10 years, if not less, there will be more and more conferences and debates and seminars where people will, will advocate intergenerational sex, and they'll, well, have, actually, they'll get a round of applause at the end. Actually, I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, sometimes I worry about that, too. But I actually think there's a lot of pushback in our culture. Really? If you, if you, yes, if you look back uh, at the 70s, the 70s was the height of this sort of idea. Uh, if you look at a movie like Manhattan with Woody Allen dating a 17-year-old girl with her father's or her, her parents' approval, yeah. there was a great deal of that stuff then. Uh, and then there was a lot of pushback against it. I don't think that ordinary people are going to go for this stuff. Um, th I, I do believe uh, people will try because, uh, look, if you look at incestuous relationships, you see that parents do groom their children and make their children feel that this is how uh, adults love children and all mm. children want to be loved. Any child can be talked into anything. They can be brutalized, too. Yes. You take children to dog fights, and pretty soon they'll be indifferent to, uh, to cruelty to animals. I mean, come on. Children are very malleable people. And uh, to put this in the guise of quality of relationship or anything, uh, that adds to the depravity of yes. the act.
Now to a CBS 12 exclusive. A student at Florida Atlantic University says he couldn't believe what he and his fellow students were asked to do by their instructor three weeks ago. The student told us he was offended and says when he complained to the instructor's supervisor, he was suspended from class. CBS 12's Al Pefley joins us live from the FAU campus in Davie with more. Al? Liz, the college student you're about to meet says he'll never forget what happened on this campus earlier this month. He says it was just plain wrong, it was offensive, and he feels the instructor in his class went too far. I felt like my intelligence was insulted. That's what I felt like. Ryan Rotella, a junior at Florida Atlantic University, says he came here to get a degree, not to get insulted by an instructor. But he says that's what happened in his intercultural communications class three weeks ago. He said, everybody write Jesus on bold letters. So what I did was I wrote Jesus just like this. And then afterwards he said, everybody put it on the floor. So he took it out, put it on the floor, and he had us all stand up. And once we were standing up, he said, stomp on it. And that's when I picked up the paper from the floor and put it right back on the table. Ryan says he couldn't believe what the instructor was saying to the class. I said to the professor, with all due respect to your authority as a professor, I just do not believe what you told us to do was appropriate. I believe it was unprofessional. And I was deeply offended by what you told me to do. He says to stomp on the name of Jesus is repulsive. Anytime you stomp on something, it shows that you believe that something has no value. So if you were to stomp on the word Jesus, it says that the word has no value. Brian says he's a Mormon and considers himself a very religious person. He says the instructor, Dr. DeAndre Poole, showed no remorse. From that point on, I knew I had to do something about it because I'm not going to be singing, sitting in a class having my religious rights desecrated. He says it's unbelievable that a college instructor would ask anyone to do this. Two days later, he went to Dr. Poole's supervisor, FAU associate professor Noemi Marin, to discuss his concerns. Ryan says since the incident, he has been suspended from that class, and the associate dean told him not to go back. And I truly see this as, you know, you know, I'm being punished. And like I said, I'm still waiting for an apology from somebody. And FAU sent us a response by email saying, quote, faculty and students at academic institutions pursue knowledge and engage in open discourse. While at times the topics discussed may be sensitive, a university environment is a venue for such dialogue and debate. Meanwhile, the school would not discuss with us whether these teachers would be facing any disciplinary action. Live in Davie, Al Pefleep, CBS 12 News. Well, some parents of elementary school students in Burlington, New Jersey, are outraged to see video of their children singing a Christian spiritual song where the name of Jesus was substituted with President Obama's. Now the school superintendent is speaking out. In a statement, he objected to the unauthorized taping and release of that videotape, but he didn't mention the school's lyrics. Sorry, the song's lyrics. Jamie Colby is live outside the school, B. Bernice Young Elementary in Burlington, New Jersey. Jamie, any more from the superintendent or teachers this morning? Well, absolutely, and a lot more from the parents, too, Allison, and the local paper. There's definitely a controversy here on both sides. Some parents are saying that it was absolutely inappropriate to substitute the words of that spiritual song with Barack Hussein Obama and for second graders to be singing about an equal pay measure that he had just signed into law. The school says it's all part of their Black History Month celebration in February, but then in June, the video hit the Internet on YouTube, and many parents were up in arms. Here's what some of them had to say on both sides. I felt that it was reminiscent of 1930s Germany and the indoctrination of children to worship dear leader. Um, my daughter was in that, the class that did the songs about Obama. It was Black History Month. It was President's Day. It was something for the kids to celebrate. Um, I just can't look at it as an indoctrination. 
And Allison, the question seems to come down to where the lyrics came from. A former Harvard classmate of Barack Obama's, her name is Sharice Carney Nunez. She wrote a book, I Am Barack Obama, which was part of the assembly and also the education process of these children singing the songs. There are some reports that she was in the classroom in the video that you're seeing. Others, including teachers, say the children themselves wrote the lyrics, including that one about equal pay. Now the superintendent is under investigation, as is the school. The education commissioner is saying a full investigation is underway. Here's the full screen quote of what the superintendent is saying today. There was no intention to indoctrinate children, as that one parent claims. There was no political agenda underlying the activity. The teacher's intention was to engage the children in activity to recognize famous and accomplished African Americans during Black History Month. So the investigation is underway, and we'll put in calls now that they're in place and open on when we'll have an answer on what will be done. The teacher that was in charge of that class has since retired, Allison. And at a parent teacher conference last night, the superintendent and principal would not answer any questions or make Make any statement about what happened back in February and in this video posted on YouTube in June. We're gonna spread happiness. We're gonna spread freedom. Obama's gonna change it. Obama's gonna lead them. We're gonna change it. change the world Because of Obama, I'm responsible to be the next lawyer. Because of Obama, I'm responsible to be the next automotive technician. Because of Obama, I'm responsible to be the next chef. Because of Obama, I'm responsible to be the next architect. Because of Obama, I'm responsible to be the next engineer. Because of Obama, I'm responsible to be the next fireman. Because of Obama, I'm responsible to be the next architect. Because of Obama, I'm responsible to be the next chemical engineer. Because of Obama, I'm inspired to be the next entrepreneur. Yes, we can. 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 Obama speaks the race of America. Yes, we can. Embrace the words of our past. Tell the dangers of our past. Yes, we can. Take more responsibility for our whole lives. Yes. This agenda in the textbooks, in the plans, you see how anti-family Hollywood is. You see the agenda. You see how anti-man it is. Uh, this is a social engineering program to break down society on record. On record to, to, to tell five-year-olds that Heather has two mommies or, you know, that Bobby has two daddies. I mean, this is, this is, this is pedophile behavior. Uh, forcing down the throat of children. Specifically, uh, sexualizing them when they're supposed to be innocent. You know, Jocelyn Elder saying, let's teach five-year-olds how to masturbate. Reach down and help them. It's just the government in our life, as MSNBC says, your kids belong to the state. And they've said back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, I cover it in the extras of, of uh, Endgame, Endgame 2.0 uh, uh, 2 that's online. 
we showed the university studies where they said we're going to promote promiscuity so that people have abortions, don't have meaningful relationships. We're going to promote homosexuality. Homosexuality has always gone on, and I'm not here even demonizing people. The point is, is that they're force feeding it, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as just a way to be trendy. That's why there's so, I mean, you see the trends now where, where, you know, a lot of women say they're lesbians, but then they end up getting married. Because they just go become a lesbian for a while because that's the trendy thing to do. Or, you know, same thing with men. Uh, and, and now they're just saying, we're pansexual, we're omnisexual. Uh, humans have always, to some degree, been like that. Mammals are. The point is, is that they are artificially trying to amplify it unnaturally with chemicals in the food and water to reduce our population numbers and to break up the family. Uh, so uh, Clinton is hailing Supreme Court uh, overturning law. Uh, he signed. There you go. I mean, it's just all part of the two-facedness. So nothing belongs to the family. That's why they say in federal documents, do not say husband and wife. It's hurtful. Remember those stories about a month ago we covered? It actually says France has made it the law. See, a father, see, see, being straight is a crime, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, look at how they demonize gun owners, conservatives, libertarians. They're, they're coming after us. Now, the average gay person is not into this, but they still will support any policy government puts out because, oh, that's their friend. That's the friend that wants them to have rights. Is that why the government in 1978 on record, this has been declassified partially, is part of a Navy program in a hepatitis operation in uh, the village uh, there, uh, in New York, gave thousands of highly promiscuous gay men who were having hundreds of partners a month. Very destructive, folks. Very destructive lifestyle at that level. HIV, just like Bayer, helped pass that around as well. Oh, they, they care about you real good. They like it you're not going to have kids. They like it you're going to die alone, statistically. They like the fact that gay men have the lowest life expectancy. They want to kill you. The last thing they want is for you to ever have the joy of children. But don't worry. Don't worry. They're going to go take heterosexuals' kids. They're hunting us. This is And give them to the gay couples. That, that's what goes on. And I'm supposed to go, here, take, take people's kids. I mean, it's liberal. Maybe we should sacrifice our kids to a big homosexual altar. Maybe have a pyramid, and you go up, and the gay priests are there, and you like, they, you know, they chop your kid up with a meat cleaver you know, to prove you're not racist or homophobic. I mean, this, uh, every society has done this in Sodom and Gomorrah. Whether you believe the Bible or not, the men come to the door and say, give us those men, come out, we're going to have sex with you. Where did they get this idea of a gang of men coming and saying, we're going to rape you? Because in every society, once this starts, the Romans, it was outlawed, folks, because they'd see what happened in other cultures. Rome rose, was stoic, got into this. And pretty soon it was Caligula dressed up like a werewolf, raping and killing children. And I, and I bring this up because this is what all elites end up doing. Raping and killing children dressed up like a werewolf. You don't know about that? Look it up. They would have big, you know, hundreds of people laying on the ground at those low tables eating. They had vomitoriums. You'd eat and eat and eat and vomit and vomit and vomit and, and feed the vomit to dogs outside. I'm not joking. Look this up. Called a vomitorium. That's where the word vomit comes from or Vulcan vomiting like lava coming out, I guess in the Latin, if memory serves. And the point, and, and the whole point, that's why it's, I guess it's also vulgate, you know, means to you know, project out, to speak. And so they would go and do all this. And by the end, it was just ripping children's heads off, stabbing them, blah, chewing their throats out, blood spraying all over the walls. I mean, that's where this goes. So, so just understand, that's where this goes. That's what's going to happen. That's where it ends. I mean, look at the BBC. Every week or two, there, there, someone's being arrested and pleading guilty to raping nine-year-old girls and devil orgies and uh, rape, uh, raping five-year-old boys and devil worshiping and necrophilia and hanging out with the royal family. And it's just it's so many articles, I can't even cover it all. Because they just want to get it to where they can do whatever they want. You understand that? So.